28th Board of Education meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. Um, and now we are reconvening from closed session and I'll have President Pond lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So let's all rise. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have no public hearing today, so we get to move on straight to the good stuff, students of the month. So can I have the team from Mary Collins at Cherry Valley come on up? To one of the Mary Collins students of the semester, Faith Gronlick. Faith started going to Mary Collins in the sixth grade. She had previously gone to Mary E. Severia, Severia Elementary School in Marin. Faith's teacher proudly presents her as one of the most brightest, most empathetic and creative people she has ever had the privilege of working with. Beyond that, Faith can be described as a girl with a passion for soccer. She's been a goalkeeper for two years, but started soccer at the age of 10. Apart from soccer, Faith is very passionate about school and the environment. She's a very hardworking student and cares a lot about, cares a lot about other people as she's incredibly empathetic. In her free time, Faith listens to lots of music and of course, always plays soccer. When I asked Faith what one of her goals in life was, she said, I just wanted to change the world and make a positive impact for the generations to come. Faith was choos chosen as one of the students of the semesters because she's caring to everybody. Her teachers and peers see her as a compassionate friend and a hardworking student. When Faith goes to high school next year, she's planning to go to Tech High and is very excited about the multiple math classes there. She has a high hopes of pursuing math in future years. She wants to take multiple honors classes and is hoping to get into a photography course as well. Uh, already looking forward to college, she wants to go to Stanford and play D1 soccer. Yeah. And while we do, while we do pictures and the photo op is Faith's uh, family and friends here. If you can rise, we want to give you some clapping too. Hi, I'm Ava Larson, and I'm excited to, to I'm excited to introduce Olivia DeLeon, one of our Mary Collins School students of the semester. Olivia started at Mary Collins School during seventh grade after attending Old Adobe, Old Adobe for fourth through sixth grade. Before then, she lived in New York. Olivia is a very musical talented. She started out playing piano and found interest in ukulele and slowly moved up to guitar. She is self-taught with the help of online resources. Olivia has been a regular participant in Showtime performances and will be performing in our annual variety show. Olivia is also an accomplished variety visual artist and loves to draw. Olivia is also an athletic uh, athlete and has recently found joy in joining a soccer team. She listens to music constantly, especially anything to do with George Michael. <laughs> Olivia has devoted an adoring friend group who she loves to go for walks and listens to music and hangs up, hanging out with. Olivia has been chosen as a student of the semester because both of her teachers and classmates know her as a kind, courageous, caring, empathetic, hardworking, resilient person. 
Her teachers appreciate the great deal of thought and creative creativity she puts into each assignment, as well as her insightful contributions to class. Olivia is a wonderful partner for group activities because she works to bring out the best in everyone around her. As a friend, Olivia is joyful, funny, supportive, creative, and trustworthy. It just feels good to be around her. Next year, Olivia will be joining her older sister at Penaluma High School, where she hopes to, um, where she hopes to join the band, learn Spanish, and maybe play soccer. After high school, she hopes to attend college, where she will continue studying music. Eventually, Olivia hopes to be a professional musician who will write and perform music that will inspire and bring joy to people. She's all. She is off to a wonderful start, and we can't wait to see and hear much more from her in the future. The end. Awesome. Do we have Olivia's friends and family in the audience? If any of you could stand. Well, here. Great job, Mary Collins at Cherry Valley. Can I have the Kenilworth team come up next? Okay. Kenilworth Junior High is proud to introduce our February Student of the Month, Peyton Horn. Payton has been chosen Student of the Month because she has truly stood out as one of Kenilworth's most impressive student leaders and citizens. Payton has maintained a 4.0 grade point average her entire time at Kenilworth with a rigorous schedule of classes that includes advanced English and accelerated math. Payton is also an important member of Kenilworth's leadership class. Mrs. Romano, Payton's leadership teacher, enthusiastically shared Payton Horn is exceptional. Peyton is fully dedicated to everything she does. When she is asked to sign up for work for one day, she signs up for five. Peyton is a mix of all that is good, strong character, empathetic, strong worth ethnic, kindness, and she is very, very smart. Outside of school, Peyton brings the same dedication and discipline to her pursuits. Impressively, Peyton is a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. In elementary school, Peyton shared her talent and passion by teaching Taekwondo to in her after-school program. In Peyton's free time, she enjoys reading and recommends the Red Queen series. After high school, Peyton would like to attend the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and study math and environmental science. All of us at Kenilworth look forward to watching this remarkable student continue to make the world a better place. Congratulations, Peyton. Congrats, Peyton. Do we have Peyton's friends and family here in the audience? Yeah. Jack was chosen Student of the Month because of his academic excellence and outstanding citizenship. Jack is truly one of the Kenilworth's best and brightest students. A 4.0 student, Jack is described by his teachers as hardworking, a positive role model who always produces work at the highest quality. Ms. Farrell, Jack's advanced English teacher, was eager to share. Jack was a student that teachers and other students respect and admire. Both his work and his worth ethic are exceptional. Jack demonstrates a mastery of content and his writing includes attention to detail. Jack can always be counted on to participate in class discussions. Jack is, has always had a smile on his face and truly makes everyone feel welcome in the classroom. Outside of school, Jack is a dedicated dancer for the Petaluma School of Ballet. Jack has been dancing for four years and has performed in Alice in Wonderland and as the Prince in the Nutcracker Suite. Jack is currently rehearsals for Hansel and Gretel. After high school, Jack would like to attend university and continue to perform with a dance company. Kenworth is proud to call Jack one of our students and we're confident that he has a bright future ahead of him. Congratulations, Jack. Congratulations, Jack. Do we have Jack's friends and family in the audience? Oh, 
Awesome. Great job, Kenilworth. Can I have Petaluma Jr. come on up? Judge Justice Salachi was chosen by his teachers and students as student of the month because his because of his calm and friendly presence, as well for being creative, polite, and a good role model, and someone who gets along with others. Mrs. Montawani, Justice's English teacher, points out that when given options, Justice will choose a challenging task over an easy one. Mrs. Montawani also shares that Justice is a talented writer whose descriptive narrator, narratives are both humorous and authentic. His math teacher, Mrs. Garvey, describes Justice as a student who works hard to explore and master math concepts and is an asset to any group he joins. When asked to describe what he enjoys most about Petaluma Junior High, Justice highlights that his art teacher, Miss O, who, who he notes is very kind and helps everyone in class. Miss O herself celebrates Justice's artistic ability. When thinking about what he most looks forward to in high school, Justice shares that he's excited to be able to explore job opportunities because there are so many options available in high school. After high school, Justice is considering becoming a lawyer. Congratulations, Justice. Congratulations, Justice. Do we have Justice's friends and family in the audience? Natalie Rodriguez was chosen by her teachers as student of the month because of the way she pushes herself to excel academically and for how she exemplifies leadership on our campus. Mrs. Montawani, Natalie's English teacher, calls her love of learning infectious, sharing that during class, Natalie expresses true joy when her group hits the aha moment in class discussion. Mrs. Montawani also celebrates that Natalie strives to get everything she can out of her learning opportunities. Mr. D, Natalie's PE teacher, also shares her perspective on Natalie, celebrating her consensus and her positive possible positivity, her encouragement of others, and her routine of starting off every day with an authentic good morning. When asked to describe something that she enjoys about PJHS, Natalie highlights her friends, her teachers, learning opportunities, and playing sports. Natalie has been a member of our girls basketball team, a participating member of our boys basketball team, and a member of our track and field team. Outside of school, Natalie plays a lot of basketball. When asked about what she most looks forward to in high school, Natalie shares that she's looking forward to making new friends, experiencing new things, and definitely playing basketball. Natalie has aspirations for life after high school, whether that is playing basketball for Oregon or Stanford, she's striving to one day play in the WNBA. Natalie also hopes to earn a degree in mechanical engineering. Congratulations, Natalie. <laughs> Congratulations, Natalie. Do we have Natalie's family in the audience? I think we do. Awesome. Thank you, Petaluma Jr. We're going to go back to the east side. Can I have Casa, Casa Grande? Come on up. Hi, my name is Cecilia and I'm an ASB sophomore at Casa Grande and our first student of the month is Garrett Christie. Garrett Christie is a Petaluma native born in Petaluma Valley Hospital on December 12, 2004 and has lived in Petaluma his entire life. He was raised by two hardworking parents to value education and put his school above all else and not make the same mistakes they did as children. It is because of all of them and their support through school and life that he has been able to achieve all he has and receive this award. Even while in elementary school, Garrett applied himself even when he struggled with spelling and math. 
While in middle school, Garrett discovered his true passion of history, which he would begin to study on his own time. Upon entering high school, Garrett would continue to apply himself to do things he had to do and wanted to do in, in and out of the classroom. Garrett's teachers describe him as a thoughtful and Thoughtful, dedicated, and kind. Garrett's plans to continue into higher education and believes this to be possible with the continued support of his family and friends. Congratulations, Garrett. We have Garrett's family and friends here in the audience. Yep. Next, we have Porfirio Mendez. Porfirio is a student from the International House and Advanced Placement Cluster at Casa Grande who enjoys challenging himself inside the classroom and sleeping outside the classroom. In school, Porfirio can be found working at whatever task is at hand and saying hi to anyone he knows. Outside of school, whenever he isn't sleeping, he can be found either studying, listening to music, playing ultimate Frisbee, or hanging out with his grandparents. Coming from a sophisticated family situation, Porfirio has grown to spend time with his grandparents and value moments with his family, becoming one of his main motivations for doing well in school. While the goal of wanting to prove himself to his family and having continuously compete with his older brother, Porfirio has made multiple academic achievements with a couple being ranking in the top 10 students in all his previous years of high school and being nominated for other educational organizations such as delegate for California Boys State. With these achievements, Porfirio hopes to attend a UC and major in biology to further advance his education in pre-med. And after another decade of education, he hopes to attain his ideal job, which is working as a pediatrician. Congratulations, Porfirio. Do we have your family in the, in the audience, friends and family? Great job, Casa, and hopping back over to the west side for last but not least, Petaluma High. Okay. Okay, today I'm presenting Nick. Um, Nick is a senior at Petaluma High School and is very grateful for all the opportunities that have been provided to him. Nick has been actively involved in a number of extracurricular activities throughout his time in high school, including clubs, sports, and work. These experiences have helped him not only broaden his skill set, but also grow as a person. Participating in clubs has allowed him to further explore his passions and collaborate with like-minded people in hopes of benefiting our school and community. After joining the Junior State of America, our speech and debate club, Nick has progressed through the ranks and developed into a leadership position as the club president this year. Through coaching and collaboration with others, the club has reestablished itself as one of the most prominent clubs on campus. After four years of participation, he hopes to set the club up for success and prosperity well past his departure. Along with this commitment, Nick discovered himself embracing his fascination with foreign language as a participant in the French club, where he now serves as secretary, complementary to his planned seal of biliteracy. Competitive in nature, Nick has enjoyed using his academic experience to further his interests by proving himself in difficult advanced and honors programs. As a dual enrollment student, Nick has chosen to take classes at Santa Rosa Junior College to enhance his pursuits and academic curiosity. He has achieved his position among the top 10% of his class as a result of his dedication and effort. As a three-year varsity lacrosse player, Nick has loved donning purple and white outside of the classroom. He struggles to think of a finer setting than playing under the lights with his friends, representing a community that has done so much for him. His passion for the sport has earned him many athletic awards and numerous spots on collegiate teams as he hopes to play at the next level. He hopes to pursue his academic and extracurricular interests at a four-year college with a degree in environmental science and policy. Nick is committing, committed to using his knowledge and expertise learned to pioneer the future by working towards sustainable solutions and advocating for positive change in the global community. Congratulations, Nick. Do we have Nick's family and friends in the audience? <laughs> 
Awesome. Okay, all you students of the month, don't go anywhere just yet. We're going to take a big group picture up here at the front, um, and then you can go back to doing homework or sleeping or whatever. <laughs> Um, so students of the month, can you guys come just, or semester, can you just come down a tiny bit for these very short grown-ups behind you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, ready, you guys? All right, what, grown-ups in the back room? Oh, whoops, we're missing. Luca, come. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll share a wrong Sorry, if you don't mind. Yeah, 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 let's go. All right, you guys. All right, grown up to the back, be tall. One, two, three. Gotcha. Thanks, guys. Congratulations again to our students of the month. We're going to take a two minute recess for all of the shuffling that is bound to happen. It's always Maddie. We are reconvening the meeting at 627. I didn't gavel out, but we're gaveling back in just in case. Oh, gaveled out. Yeah. Um, so now we will be having a presentation from one of our wonderful Petaluma Valley Rotary um, about their Lend a Hand to Education grant. So uh, is someone introduced? Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, good evening. The Petaluma Valley and Petaluma Sunrise Rotary Lend a Hand to Education Teacher Grant Program has distributed nearly 316,000 to Petaluma teachers since 2004. These grants have helped fund teachers for special projects, equipment, and or supplies in classrooms for TK through 12th grade, demonstrating that a community working together can make a difference in children's education. With us tonight to present more on the Lend a Hand to Education Program is Libby Fitzgerald and Dave Hansen. Dave is a member of the Rotary Club of Petaluma Sunrise, where he had previously served as a club president for a term and has lived in Petaluma for about 35 years. He and his wife, Pat, have two daughters, Christy and Erica, who graduated from Casa Grande High School. His wife also taught at uh, Sonoma State University for 25 years in the psychology department. Dave served in the US Navy and submarines, holds a degree in chemistry from Occidental College and an MBA from Cal State Fullerton, and has a long successful career with Bechtel, an engineering construction and project management firm. Retired, Dave still tinkers with computers, teaching at SRJC and enjoying his grandkids and volunteering his time with the community and being all around great person. <laughs> Libby is a member of the Rotary Club Petaluma Valley and for the past 27 years have, serves, have served on that Rotary Club and having formerly served as a president back in 2003, 2004 and has lived in Petaluma for 43 years. Along with her husband, John, they have 14 nieces and nephews plus 18 grand nieces and nephews. Libby, organic chemistry by trade, was a president and CEO of Petaluma-based Alpha Chemical Biomedical Laboratories and a part of a committee that pioneered standardized methods of analyzing dietary supplements. She also has some outstanding accomplishments, such as the 2002 North Bay Women in Business Award for Science and Technology, 2012 Petaluma Community Award Excellence for Service to Youths, 2015 Citizens of the Year Award, as well as serving for several years in the Sonoma County Economic Development Board. We are so honored to have such distinguished, caring, supportive advocates for the community, our teachers and education system. And at this time, I would like to invite Libby and Dave to share more about the Lend a Hand to Education. All right. Good to be back and see some familiar places. Thank you, Tony, for that great introduction. Um, I don't have to say anything more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So um, yeah, Dave and I are here today uh, to bring you the good news uh, that Rotary is again providing some financial support for additional educational opportunities in our local schools. And the, um, as, as Tony mentioned, this program was started in the 2003-04 year uh, where the Rotary International uh, theme was Lend a Hand and if you want to take a look at my little pin later, it's this large hand of 
the adult or the teacher reaching down to the child. It's just beautiful. And that's how we adopted the name, Lend a Hand to Education. So this year, um, uh, teachers were given mini grants uh, of up to $250 for special projects, um, field trips, equipment and supplies in the classroom. And this is for TK through 12th grade. And it, literacy and education is one of Rotary's main focuses. We have seven avenues of focus and literacy and education is one of the primary ones. We share the responsibility to take action in our world's most persistent issues. This is at the top of our list. And we start, we do this internationally, but we start here at home. So um, this year, total amount that was given, uh, that was raised to give to all of the schools in Petaluma, 23 schools, totaled $26,734. Of that total, the Petaluma City School District was provided a check for $11,309 to support 51 teachers in 12 schools. We already gave that check to you last month, so <laughs> it's in the system for the teachers to tap into. And um, I'm gonna let Dave talk a little bit more about some of the fun grants that we funded. It was a great pleasure for me to see all the students, this great collection that you've got, because they're the ones that we're working to uh, support. And what I'm gonna talk about is basically examples of the grants that we gave. Uh, just, I'm just gonna list them because it's, um, they're varied in a wide range of grants and they do all sorts of different things. A Casa Grande High School teacher was Jennifer Titus, a grant for science lab, real life issues, impacts of vaping and drug use. There was a grant to Mary Collins at Cherry Valley. The teacher was Kiri Bailey. It's a grant for bringing back maps, a multi-layered pull-down map. I imagine that would be a map on the wall that we need to pull down. For McDowell, the teacher was Angelo Werner, a grant for a steelhead field trip and a classroom program. McKinley, the teacher was Katie Gill. The grant was for equipment for a film course study. McNear School, four K through three teachers received grants for phonemic awareness books. Petaluma High School, Wayne Street got a teacher's grant for an LCD, <clears throat> excuse me, an LCD projector for social sciences. Petaluma Junior High School, the teacher was Sarah Brooks Long, a grant for kitchen chemistry. And San Antonio High School, the teacher Amanda Kirk got a grant for project-based learning, tabletop planters. So there were many other grants and we've also gave grants to other the schools in the uh, Petaluma area outside, but uh, they're all interesting. They're interesting things that just stuff that the teachers need to help their classroom teaching along. So very, very worthwhile. We enjoyed doing it. Thanks. Thank you so much to Petaluma Valley and Petaluma Sunrise Rotary for all of your support for all the schools in Petaluma, but especially Petaluma City Schools, you know, that's why we're here. Um, that was wonderful. And now we will go on to comments from the public on non-agendized items. So if you have a comment um, on something that's not on the agenda, now would be your time to speak. So please, um, if you're coming in on Zoom, put your name and the topic you wish to address in the chat. Um, and while I read the uh, rules. And if you're in person and you haven't put in a red a speaker's card, um, please bring one up to us while I'm talking. 
Under Government Code Section 54954.3a, members of the public have the right to address the governing board on any items of interest, providing it relates to, to the subject matter jurisdiction of the school district, while Government Code allows speakers to criticize the district's policies, procedures, programs, services, and or employees. The district does have a policy specific to complaints against employees. Should comments from the public pertain to a specific district employee, the board requests that the complaint first be submitted in writing to the employee's immediate supervisor for investigation. If the comment is about something not on the agenda, it will be heard only during the public comment on non-agendized items period. Once this part of the meeting is over, comments will only be taken on agendized items during the discussion of those items. The board values public comments, and although we cannot take action or discuss items not on the agenda, we listen carefully and appreciate input from the public. Public comments are limited to a four minute per person limit or 20 minute limit per subject matter. And I'm not seeing any in the chat. Is that right, Dave? Great. Um, and I'm not, everything here is on the agenda. So we will move forward um, to adoption and approval of the agenda. Do I have any motions? I move to approve the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Wonderful. Um, and now I will ask President Pond to report on the activities and correspondence of school board members. Okay, um, so this month, office hours at Pengrove, Kenilworth, McNear, Valley Vista, equity committee meeting, facilities meeting at CASA, CASA government class visit, CASA girls basketball game, arts and music committee, safety committee, budget advisory committee, um, housing land trust of Sonoma County meeting, and then our student board members, health sciences club, environmental advocacy club, Costa Grande School Site Council meetings, Petaluma Wildlife Museum, various activities with them, open houses, birthday parties, zoo hall, and in-class tours to elementary schools and the Santa Rosa Senior Center. Additionally, overnight field trip to Oregon and Arcata with the Petaluma Wildlife Museum, overnight field trip with Petaluma High School Marine Science to Monterey, PHS Winter Formal. Um, Volunteer hours. I don't know if I got if that. Alan, you might have to expound on that. Uh, practice interviews for the Press Democrat Youth Service Awards, broadcast journalism class tours for incoming eighth graders from Petaluma Junior, Petaluma High School Recycling Club planning for a recycling drive. Okay, you guys are busy <laughs> and you're here. I think I got them all. Was there anything I left out for you guys, the students? No. Did you want to talk about any of those, Mia? You did a sure. lot. Sure. Um, I'll expand on that Youth Service Award scholarship. So I was nominated for the 2023 Press Democrat Youth Service Award. Um, it's basically a community service award. Um, and my category is for government and political action. Um, and when I was counting my volunteer hours, I had like 200 volunteers I didn't even know about. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> Half of that was a museum. So. <laughs> Alan or Julian? Sorry. Did you want to speak about any of your activities? You don't have to, but if you wanted to, this is the time. Uh, not much. Just my club taught another lesson, more about health and just more tree planting, continuing at CASA and almost finishing up on that. And then my adult board members, do any of you have any Thing you want to comment on from all the wonderful things we've been up to well great thank you president pawn um so now we will take comments from the public on consent items again please put your name in the chat as well as what um item you would like to talk about even if you don't know the number i do need to know what item you want to talk about um and if anyone would like to fill out a red card here and um, in person, you are welcome to do so, but I am not seeing any red cards for anything on the consent agenda at this time. Okay. Okay, yeah, if you can just fill out another one, yeah. None of them. So we'll leave the chat open for another 30 seconds or so if anyone has a comment on a consent agenda items. There we go. 
stringing words together today. Thank you. Um, okay, you can come on up. Uh, we'll have Jennifer Inden speak about one of the comprehensive school safety plans or all of them and you have four minutes. Perfect. All right, so I talk fast. So hopefully I'll fit it in <laughs> and I won't sound like an auctioneer. Um, all right, so um, my name is Jennifer Inden and I am a native Petalumen and myself, my husband, and all of our siblings uh, are graduates of Casa Grande High School, and I currently have a 10th grader at Casa. Um, the Columbine school shooting took place 21 years ago. I'm pretty sure everybody sitting in this room remembers it. I remember it very clearly. I was home from school that day, and it was the first uh, school shooting that I had ever seen that live coverage of. Uh, and I remember thinking, I'm really glad that we don't have to worry about that here naively thinking school shootings weren't endemic and that our schools uh, and our small town was safe. Unfortunately, it's not true. It wasn't then and it's not now. Um, violence on school campuses only continues to happen more often and with the most recent school shootings just two weeks ago uh, in Pittsburgh where four students were shot, a school was dismissed by the day. This doesn't count other acts of violence on schools campuses that happen all the time. By these measures, we here in Petaluma have been really lucky. We haven't had to deal with mass shootings, thank goodness. But I think everybody in this room can acknowledge that being prepared for such an incident should be as innate as breathing. This isn't a new phenomena, but from the lack of response to the recent student assault at CASA and the lack of safety measures and, lang and the language being used by the CASA administration, you would think it is. I'm pretty sure we've all heard about the incident that took place on the Casa Grande campus on February 17th, where two masked intruders came into a classroom and assaulted a student. The assailants left the classroom and were unidentified and at large for several days. At no time was the school put into lockdown as their comprehensive school safety plan states is the procedure in an instance like this. Parents were not notified until after 3 p.m. that afternoon and the notification to the school faculty wasn't much better. Since then, there's been two additional communications, one from Dr. Osterman giving very general update and giving the same lip service he has since my child became a CASA student last school year about the seriousness of safety on campus. And another one from Super Superintendent Harris where he admitted that a lockdown should have happened, but didn't. <clears throat> the language used by both Dr. Osterman and Superintendent Harris indicate that the assailants were known to be students and that's why a lockdown was not initiated. I beg to differ. This was an assumption. The assailants were masked. I will say that it's probably a fair assumption given that, uh, that the, their communications also included the language, uh, but given that their communications also included the language of, out of an abundance of caution in multiple communications, their actions simply do not show that caution. Knowing that I'm coming from a place of ignorance, I started to learn about our comprehensive school safety plans required by all California schools. And I say it's quite timely that they're on the agenda tonight for approval and review. Uh, so I searched all the school sites. I searched the district site. And you know what I found? Upkiss. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. I found a bunch of results. Uh, that listed in the search, but most of the links, in fact, 98% of the links were broken. None of them worked. In fact, the only thing that I found beyond a sentence on some of the school sites of our comprehensive school safety plan is reviewed annually. Uh, I found one from McKinley dated from 2020. The rest of the links were dead. So this past Monday, I walked into Casa's office and asked to see the CSSP. The receptionist looked at me like I had two heads. 15 seconds. Okay, so I'm going to really jump ahead. Basically, it took three VPs telling me that I uh, that they had to get approval for me to see the CSSP, um, which obviously was not true. I finally was able to get it. So, okay, I'm sorry, I have to stop you there, Jennifer. Okay. Thank you. So sorry. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. I'll submit the rest comment. in writing. Absolutely. You Thank can email you. us. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing nothing else, no other, everything else looks like it is on 
um, action items. So I will move forward um, for approval of the consent agenda by consolidated motion. I move to approve the consent agenda. Great, now does anyone have any questions or comments about any of the items on the consent agenda? When we do get to the comprehensive school safety plans, um, I asked Maite to just present just a little bit of more information for everybody. Would it be helpful if we do that presentation before we start asking questions? Sure. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. So I just have a little bit of information to share with you today about the plans. Um, as many of you know, we've, we've initiated a safety committee this, um, this year, and many of you have participated in that. And that is um, a work in progress to better our safety plans. So um, I just wanted to tell you, share a little bit with you that safety plans are developed in collaboration with school site. Um, they are, they include everything from a natural emergency to a threat to a school. Um, and again, they're developed through, they're approved through the school site council. Many school sites have safety teams that they run their plans through. Um, and the plans are not posted on websites because we don't want people to have access to what our plans are in the event of emergency. And they are available in school offices for that. Um, the planning timeline um, September, October, they identify a team, create um, a vision for the plan, gather information, set some goals. Um, they identify any change strategies that need to take place. Um, they are adopted and then come to you for approval in February. In March and June, there's always an evaluation. These are living documents because conditions are always changing. So we keep them, they are approved, but we are always looking to improve them. Um, I do want to share with you a little bit about um, the goals of the safety committee. Um, they are to increase communication and um, emergency response within Petaluma City Schools and the greater community. So a lot of what we're doing is building networks with our first responders. So we all have relationship and we know who we can contact. Um, we, you know, I have PPD on speed dial. I'm texting with them quite often. So we're able to communicate pretty easily. We have first responders. We have uh, community organizations, participating parents, staff. We're also working to make the district plans and the site plans more actionable. Often it's the practicing that needs to happen that we're working towards. Um, we also have created a website that is a resource um, library for staff and for parents, and we have that's not completely launched yet. We're also providing training for all our site staff and emergency preparedness, everything from incident command to search and rescue to all of the other um, things that fall into um, the needs of a safety plan to be prepared. Uh, we had a training last night from uh, Resig 
And she actually suggested, she taught us about incident command and the importance of that. And she suggested that school sites even practice incident command on a low level thing. Like if you're planning for a dance, use an incident command model just so that you're practicing it in these low risk areas. Um, and then we are also working, we have our final meeting coming up and um, we'll be planning for the future of the committee because we see it being an ongoing need for our, for our community. Um, in August, these are de the deliverables. They'll be the website. Uh, we have a vision grid, which will provide school sites with some ideas on the things that they need to be including in their safety plans. We also have an incident command that'll be developed for our district. And then there will be a district safety plan. And some of those will be in draft form, but hopefully they'll be close to being completed. And I think that was my last slide. Um, do you have any questions about the safety plans at this point? Do any of you have? I have one question or I guess idea. I understand, at first I didn't understand why they weren't on the website. Now I understand why they're not on the website. Is there a way to upload part of it that like an amended version that doesn't have maybe mass shooter and bomb threats, but. We're looking yeah. at an executive summary. That was mm. one of the suggestions made to us is to put an executive summary, leave the maps out, leave the right. things out that we would not want people to know. But yes, some kind, we haven't developed it yet, sure. but it is one of the things that has been suggested to us. Great, thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. I had a question more about the uniformity. Um, looking at all of the, I mean, all of the plans, they didn't seem to follow the same format. Like some, some of them just copy and pasted ed code. Some of them had, um, you know, like LCAP type of goals and how they're gonna meet goals. Um, and then CASA was the only school that I saw that had their suspension rates. And those were very alarming. I just have to call that out. Like at CASA, 10% of the suspensions are black students, even though they're only 1% of the population. Hispanic students, 48% of suspensions. Um, and then just overall, you know, again, some of them posted youth truth data, some didn't, and we're seeing large numbers of students aren't feeling safe. Um, so yeah, can you speak to yeah. potentially getting uniformity or if that's something that's been talked about? Yeah, we're working towards that. There's a little bit of tension right now between people who have done them traditionally in a format that's not DTS, and we're trying to get people to shift over to the DTS system. Okay. There's strong feelings about both of them, but we are working towards uniformity. And um, I do ask that more data be posted because that's how they should be developing their goals. So that is something that we continue to work towards. Incident command was one of my biggest uh, concerns with these plans. So, but in the future, uh, more data needs to be mm -hmm. so that the goals can be developed around them so we can start to lower those suspension rates. Right. Yeah. So I don't know which way we're gonna go with the DTS or the, I'm more inclined to go with DTS because it is a, it is a more formal process, um, but there is a little tension about those plans and people's okay. attachment and, to certain formats. And then another question, I guess, about like the way that they're created, it didn't seem uniform either. Like some had like a two person committee and some had like 10. And there was a lot of in between. Yes, yes, they should be going through their site councils. Okay. Um, and they and some school sites have created safety committees. Casa, Mary Collins. Um, I can't think of all the other ones, but some of them have created safety committees outside of their site councils. So that may be where the difference is: okay. is that they want even more feedback from their school community outside the school site council. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, along those lines of uniformity, sorry, oh. I'm back. Hi, nice, <laughs> nice to have you back. I was wondering you know, when you were coming back. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, I just wanted to say about uniformity, um, I believe there was an email about, um, at, at CASA specifically, I don't know whether it's the case at other schools, that, uh, that the uniformity around the, the covering of the windows and the locks 
um, it wasn't it wasn't there. And so when I taught at Casa, I remember that we had a a, um, a lockdown, and you know those things came up. Well, that was seven years ago. So I was just wondering. Um, but not why, but if there uh, can the district have some kind of, you know, uh, things that are included that are necessary at each site, like being able to lock from the inside or whatever is the best, make it because those windows with the blind, I used to have like a, you know, a cardboard thing and the one student, that job would be to cover the windows with the cardboard that was with tape. Yeah. So. I don't, yeah. you know, so anyway, it's just a question to throw out that, um, it, you know, I know that there's a financial um, piece to it, but it seems like we should be supporting that. In some yeah, way. so um, there is, so to answer your question and on a couple of levels, um, we're consulting with PPD and then I'm also interviewing and vetting a couple of security companies in the area. I've reached out to the NAACP to find somebody who does it with an equity lens. So to try to get a few different folks to help us do some walkthroughs of the campuses and help to identify things that need to be addressed. Then we need to develop a budget for it. And I think CASA is moving ahead to be able to measure and figure out which windows they need addressing because I believe that's one of the most exposed campuses. So they are moving ahead with that is my understanding of the latest. But we are also looking at being able to walk through all the campuses, yeah. but trying to find yeah. some expertise to help us know what we should be looking for. PPD is willing to take a first glance at it, but I think we also need another level. We need some, we want to be sure that we're addressing the needs of our schools with, through our staff and our parents and our students and make sure that we're holding that equity equity lens with that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Another piece we talked about in the safety committee was the need to have fully stocked first aid kits in every classroom. Again, there's a price to that, but that was one of the things we felt was needed. Also staff training in how to use those first aid kits. So that's all on the forefront there. Thanks for the reminder, Ellen. And also Ramona Faith mentioned to me at the end of the meeting that she's willing to, to train our staffs. And the other thing that came up that was really lovely yesterday is that we have our students who are trained in CPR and first aid too. So we've got, we're, you know, we're working on making sure that our, our school campuses are prepared. Thank you for the reminder of that. My take can you um, speak about uh, site practice and training for these safety plans. You know, when I read CASAs, you know, I'm seeing the incident commander and the structure that we talked about in the safety committee. It looks good on paper, but it seemed like it, you know, it, it didn't happen um, last week. And then, and then I'm also wondering, because so much uh, authority and um, decision-making is placed on the single incident commander, what kind of uh, continuity can we get across the district at all our sites in terms of their training in what kinds of situations have a lockdown versus get out of the room yeah. versus those kind of things. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a tension there between evacuation and, and shelter in place as well. We are, um, you met Christine last night, so she's going to help train our lead, our leadership in leading in an emergency. So that's one of the sessions that are leading in a crisis. I can't remember the name of it, but that's one of the trainings that our our site leadership will be going through. Also, it was mentioned yesterday that we really need to do a baseline for everybody. We need to find a chunk of time to give everybody the basics. And that's been, you know, we're looking for, the, for those, those chunks of time. Um, as far as consistency, uh, we're working on identifying, um, actually, we've been working on a document today, the difference between a known intruder right, a known situation, or not an intruder, but a known threat and an unknown threat, because those are two very different things. And how do we handle one versus the other? A known threat, we generally have a, we know who it is, we do an assessment, we offer some services, we may involve PPD, we may only communicate with that school site because it's contained there. Unknown threats are bigger, 
and cause a little more fear because we're not sure where it's coming from. So we may communicate to a wider audience and we do a lot that those kinds of investigations take quite a bit of time. But to your point about a, a lockdown, it really, those, that's, we need to refine that. We're meeting with the principals in the next couple of days to say here, when in doubt, lock it down. Um, it's easier to communicate that we've locked it down than to communicate that we chose not to for, for whatever reason. So um, I think we're, um, I'm meeting with the secondary principals tomorrow to have that conversation. And then after we develop a plan through them, we'll be working with the elementary principals in a similar situation because there are reasons for both. We, a lockdown is often initiated by PPD, but not always. It needs to be able to be initiated at the school site as well. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Julian, Alan, Mia, do any of you have any questions or comments? I actually do. So yesterday, about during second period for Costa Grande, there was a, apparently, as Dr. described, a transient individual, and there was a modified lockdown. So can you clarify like why a modified lockdown versus a lockdown occurs? Because personally, for me, what I'm thinking is that a modified lockdown, that sounds like a stranger, an individual that we don't know about is traversing through our campus without permission. And I think that warrants a full lockdown. It's either a full lockdown or a not lockdown to me. So I'm just curious what you think about that. So uh, in this case, he was already off. The, he was headed off the campus and PPD was on the way. So we didn't, we, we went with a modified lockdown. A, a, a full lockdown would be that you've got an intruder on campus and they are aggressively attacking the campus and you aren't really, that is a full lockdown, right? This, is, this was a modified lockdown that was chosen because he was on his way off the campus he was not arguing, he wasn't aggressive, he was being escorted off um, and PPD was on the way. So that's why we made the decision for a modified lockdown. We don't want people leaving the classroom, but we want teaching to continue. It's not, it's not that you're having to barricade the door or we want to differentiate between those two things. Could you explain exactly what a modified lockdown looks like? It's, lock, it's locking the doors. It's doing this, many of the similar things that you would do in a regular lockdown, but you're not barricading the door. You're not trying to hide the children. You're just, there's, we often use it. There may be a down wire. There may be a loose dog. There may be this person who's on the campus and we're not sure who it is. And we're get, they're peacefully leaving the campus. There's no reason to start throwing furniture in front of the door. Any Did other that answer your question, Alan? Thank you. Any other questions or comments about school safety plan? Any other questions or comments about anything else on the consent agenda? I had a question. Actually, I'd like to hear more about the phone lines. Chris, is that you? Well, I would say it's me and, and our IT department, Dave Fashera. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we, we've been systematically going through and replacing phone systems throughout our campuses because most of them are pretty old. Mm -hmm. um, at San Antonio, we had an opportunity because the phone system actually failed. And so um, we got our IT department involved because we realized, you know, we have our dark fiber project that we did a couple of years ago with Sonic, three years ago. We now have greater technology to support things like VoIP. Um, and so really the phone, phone systems are moving more into the IT arena than they are in the old low voltage electricians arena, which is generally where it's lived. Still, there's, a, there's an interface between the two. And so we're um, taking the opportunity to kind of get a repair in, which we've done. So their phones are back up and working or they have phones right now. Um, while we're working through identifying what is a better long-term solution for the district to be moving it. It could be the solution that we've already started down the path, but because we now have the infrastructure to support things like VoIP, um, we wanna just have a thoughtful approach to what is the best 21st century solution for our phones. Um, did that, okay, does that answer your question? Because, and I would just add, because we do need to start replacing more phone systems. San Antonio aside, we know we've got um, Petaluma Junior High, we've got Casa Grande, um, we've got uh, several school sites where we really need to redo their phones, but they're on much grander scale. 
Um, so it's going to take a lot of planning. Can you speak more about the E rate discount? Yes, the E rate. So E rate used to be, well, it's a federal program. It used to fund things like telecommunications. It's really moved over more into hardware and equipment that support the infrastructure for all of our technology. And so um, we can apply for this funding and leverage it. It's a 60-40 split, 60-40 split where they pay 60%, we have to match 40%. And so I think as you walk, as you read through the board item, back in 2015, we did this whole bandwidth improvement where we replaced a lot of our switches and other hardware that supports our connectivity. Um, we're planning, and by we, I mean really David Fischer, I wanna give him credit because he's been working with his team um, on really planning for um, making sure that we have a replacement plan in place while all of that technology is still fully functional because we know it's hitting its eight year mark uh, next year. And we wanna make sure that we're leveraging federal E-rate dollars um, and then using our portion as, out of the special reserve for capital outlay. So does that answer? And yeah. there's a whole process you have to go through. It's tedious and kudos to Dave for working um, to, get, to get that application made. Yeah, I just thought it was great that we had, that we were getting such a huge amount back, so yeah. Well, and, and, and trying to be prepared so that all of this work is being done in advance and not waiting for the systems to start or the equipment to start mm -hmm. bailing, so. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on any consent agenda items? Well, we have a motion and it was seconded, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Um, now we are moving on to comments from the public on action items. And we do have a few already. Um, if you're here in person to make comment on a, one of the three action items, please make sure to fill out a red card real quick and bring it up here. If you're in on Zoom, please put your name and which of the three action items you would like to comment on in the chat. I do need to know which action item you want to speak on because I need to figure out how to divide up the 20 minutes per item. So I'll leave the chat open for about a minute and give folks time to fill out cards. All right, um, given the number of cards I have, I'm gonna give everybody three and a half minutes to speak. Um, out of respect for other speakers, please do stop when I ask you to stop. Um, and you are more than welcome to email us and the superintendent um, the full length of whatever you have to say or any additional thoughts you have after. So first, can I have Kathy Chambers? Am I standing in the right closer? Yeah, you're... Okay. That's good? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can hear myself. Cool. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Kathy Chambers. I'm speaking on item number 14.1.3, specifically the elimination of the following classified members' positions. Nancy Swanson, Valley Vista Child Care Assistant Director, Blanca Gerhardt, and Rochelle Rodriguez, Valley Vista Child Care Assistants. I have worked at Valley Vista since 1987, and I was an instructional assistant for over 27 years, a Valley Vista child care assistant for 24 years. I am now the Valley Vista garden instructor, which I've done for eight years, and I'm a sub at Valley Vista child care. I'm also a community member. 
The district run Valley Vista Child Care was established on campus almost 40 years ago. On average, we had 65 to 85 students a day and 100 or more on Wednesday and conference weeks. Parents got transfers from other schools just to attend our exceptional child care. Parent staff and former staff members were shocked and saddened during the pandemic that our unique child care, which serves students TK through sixth grade, was reduced to just TK and kindergarten students. On Friday, our staff was informed of a resolution that was going to the board tonight, eliminating our wonderful TKK child care. I would like to begin with the first page of the resolution under the word situation. It basically states that several temporary positions were added over the past two years based on one-time COVID funding and were necessary to address the impacts of COVID. I remind you that our child care was established in, I believe, 1984. The child care positions you will be voting on are not temporary. Nancy Swanson has worked at child care for 12 years. Blanca was hired in 2016, laid off from child care during the pandemic, and began working again at the child care in 2021. Rochelle has worked at Valley Vista since 2015, was a sub at child care for years, and hired as a child care assistant this year. On the second paragraph under situation, it states that the classified positions listed on the resolution will be eliminated due to the lack of work and lack of funds. There's no lack of work and the child care is bringing in funding monthly. Nancy has deposited over $88,000 since the child care opened in 2021. We have heard that this program is being cut due, due to ELLP grant. The grant is not mentioned in the resolution you will be asked to vote on. When you are voting, I'd like you to consider that you will be eliminating a community-based child care and getting rid of people who have worked at our school for years. By eliminating Valley Vista child care, you are taking away our Valley Vista family members, Blanca, Nancy, Rochelle. They are experienced professionals who have daily contact with the kindergarten teachers, are well known by staff at Valley Vista, know and follow the school's rules, have lovingly taken care of children for years and are highly regarded, longtime dedicated employees of Valley Vista School and Petaluma City School District. Please make your decision in the best interest of our children. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Next up, I have Lonnie. Hi, I'm speaking uh, on the same resolution as Kathy Chambers. I'm a parent of two children at Valley Vista Elementary School. The first thing I heard about Valley Vista was how amazing the childcare was. It was what drew me to the school, both the staff and the affordability. My son was always happy at Valley Vista childcare in the care of Miss Nancy and the other staff there. When we first sent him there, he would be there for hours after attending school, but I never worried about him because I knew that the program would allow him to play, to read a book, or just be outside and wind down from a day of learning. I was sad to hear that champions would be taking over childcare during the pandemic uh, for first through sixth grade, especially when I discovered that my only options were to pay for an entire day <clears throat> when we only needed childcare for a couple hours. We elected to allow our son to walk home by himself and sent our daughter to the Valley Vista run childcare for TK and K. And we're incredibly happy with that. When this change happened, families were not informed of the intent to bring champions until the decision was already made. When I heard a couple days ago that the positions of staff at Valley Vista childcare were to be eliminated, I was shocked that families were not notified or consulted with, or consulted with. Childcare is an undervalued service, but a basic need that our families rely on. It is often a source of stress and anxiety for parents, and parents should have a voice when any changes are proposed. Ms. Nancy and the other staff at Valley Vista not only work at childcare, but also serve as yard duty staff and are trusted adults that children feel comfortable approaching for help. I can't stress enough how important these trusted adults are when it comes to children feeling safe at school. Extending their presence from yard duty to childcare helps create a sense of community. This is what we value most about Valley Vista. Miss Nancy taught my son to finger knit. She helps kids work out their differences with their friends and she truly loves our kids. There are more parents that are upset by this who were unable to make it tonight. Some wrote letters, some were not able to. And I urge the board to hold off on making a decision until the district reaches out to families for feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, I have Kendra. Hi, 
So, uh, my name is Kendra Benson, and I've come here today, like many others, to express my distress at learning the TKK child care headed by Nancy Swanson and assisted by Ms. Blanca and Rochelle is being closed at the end of the school year. As I mold this over, I was reminded at how expensive Champions Child Care is. And I've heard time and time again from families of children that currently have to use their services, how expensive and inflexible it is. If my daughter was to continue at Bella Vista, she would not attend Champions due to the cost. My family is fortunate in that I work from home and can pick her up from school now. It wasn't always like this at the beginning of my daughter's time at Valley Vista. And I was thankful for the cost TKK childcare was. Being I worked retail with inflexible shifts and my husband is one of your teachers. I also appreciated how lovely Nancy and her assistants were. When my daughter was having trouble with classmates in school, Nancy stepped in time and time again to help me feel confident that my daughter was safe in her care. She was always safe in her care and she cares for our children. This led me to the curious thought, do the individuals that work at Champions work within the school in any way? From what I understand, no. How does a child, a young child approach a stranger when they have issues with other students, et cetera, when they are not familiar with the adult in charge. Those relationships of trust can take months to well over a year to grow. Having Nancy and the other assistants also involved in the, on the campus in so many ways makes a huge difference. It's not just childcare they provide, it's recess and lunch duty, et cetera. Will they continue to work for Valley Vista if they do not have the childcare time toward their income? What is the long-term repercussions of this situation? What homework has the district done about this? I also have concerns about the cost for lower income families that might seriously need childcare in order to work for and provide for their families well after or before the bell rings. I understand that PCS benefits from the ELOP funds to help me, uh, mitigate the cost of childcare for families in various ways. Are there childcare scholarships available? Where has this been posted for families on Valley Vista website or the PCS website? If it's there, it's not easy to find. Where are these funds being made available to families to help offset the cost of childcare if this truly is part of the fund's purpose? The inequity that Valley Vista faces is astounding. This school deserves much more attention than it is given. I directly believe the low income, the role, low enrollment stems from lack of push PCS is giving to this campus to get a foot in the door competing with other campuses in the same district, the same district. Why I ask you, I ask you to ask yourself, why is this inequity continuing? And what is truly being done to remedy this? Removing the TKK, an amazing program that so Kendra, many families have, have enjoyed seconds. would just add to this inequity. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we'll have Adrian. My name is Adrian Saslow. I have a second grader, Miriam, who taught you guys a handshake, uh, and a kindergartner, Derek, who's currently enrolled in the child care program. His favorite parts of child care are Legos and Miss Nancy. He said so this evening. The summary from me is that Valley Vista Child Care Program is affordable, flexible, accessible to families. It has a wonderful culture of nurture and support the Valley Vista staff running the program under Nancy Swanson are key to this. As other people have said, they're on campus. My daughter knows who they are and she's never been through that program, but she loves them and it's amazing. The, I'm gonna guess it's ELO P money should be used to support the program run by Valley Vista. I'm certain it would be more work than outsourcing the care. I mean, of course it's like here at Boys and Girls Club Champions or YMCA, I just take the money and make it happen. but it's worth it to keep it here. Keep it in our school culture. Keep it with our stakeholders. I know we love that word. Keep it here in the community with us on campus. Make it happen. I know you guys can. You guys are awesome. Thank 
Next up, we have Shireen. When my eldest son, who's now in the fourth grade, began at Valley Vista and TK, we chose the school mostly for childcare reasons. My sister, who watched my younger son, had children who attended Valley Vista, so it would be easier for her to drop off and pick up my son from the same school. And she told me that he would love attending Valley Vista childcare on the days when she wasn't watching him. Both of my boys loved their time at Valley Vista childcare. When we were there, I knew they were safe and happy. It was extremely convenient because we were able to pay by the hour. As my husband and I both teach in the district, the childcare coverage we need is for a very short amount of time before and after school. When we came back to campuses after distance learning, I was dismayed to find out that we would no longer have Valley Vista childcare and that it would be replaced for grades one through six with champions. Champions is much more expensive than Valley Vista childcare and I missed my sons being with the staff at Valley Vista childcare. When I first talked to someone in management at Champions about signing up my children there, I asked if they had an hourly option as I told her that we would be paying a ridiculous amount for the amount of hours we needed, even with the school employee discount and the discount for having multiple children in the program. She suggested that we keep our kids in childcare for longer each day so that we would be paying less per hour by using more of the hours we paid for. I told her that I didn't want my kids to be in childcare longer. She eventually extended a discount for us that was much more palatable and we enrolled our children in Champions. Our kids were happy, but we didn't really like the program as much as we liked Valley Vista Child Care. This year we started with Champions, but it took a while to receive a response from their management about getting a discount again. We were receiving a different message from their management about discounts than others in the same site and others were receiving a different message than they had heard from Champions earlier in the same school year. Even when they gave us a discount, we decided to stop sending our children to Champions since we didn't feel comfortable with an organization that we felt was not transparent about how to receive a scholarship, was not allowing families to pay by the hour, and was going back on their word with other families. We were not happy in the first place that part of Valley Vista Child Care was being replaced. We are even less happy that it may be gone altogether, even though our children are now too old to benefit from the TKK Child Care Program. Even though my children cannot benefit from the program, I still would hate for it to be to go away. Thank you. And the last comment I have on this item is Lisa. Hello, Alan. Good to see you and good to see you, Matthew. Um, I just have a few quick comments. Is So my name is Lisa Hua. Uh, I am the mother of a TKer in childcare and also a second grader at Valley Vista. I am also an assistant professor at Sonoma State University, and I utilize the after school care because I teach uh, undergraduates and graduate students at Sonoma State. Um, and, you know, I don't have much to add. Um, yeah, I just, I'm here to really underscore how wonderful Valley Vista childcare is. So, Miss Nancy, Ms. Rochelle, Ms. Blanca, I'm here to support them and to ask you to rethink about this um, uh, the resolution. So I was only notified about this yesterday. So I rushed after class today to make sure I was here to let you know that I'm in full support of them. And childcare has really changed our family life where I'm able to teach college age students with my kids being in a very supportive environment. Um, and so I, I don't have additional things to add except just to request the board to think about maybe extending this resolution or to rethink and find additional funds to support childcare. Um, as a parent, there are many other parents I know that feel very passionate about keeping childcare. Unfortunately, I just heard about this yesterday. So we were not informed and the PTA was also not informed of this very dramatic decision. So. I'm requesting as a parent and also as a local educator, if you could rethink or at least table this discussion for this resolution, just so more parents, and I'm sure many of them would come and pledge their support in supporting Valley Vista. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Uh, I didn't see any more in the chat and I don't see any more red cards. So we are gonna move on to our action items. So our first action item is one of my personal favorites if anyone wants to do anything with it. I move to stay in hybrid for another month. Second. Uh, any comments or questions on 
the next month doing hybrid or fully in person or fully remote? This is going to change, right? Like people can't participate anymore on Zoom. Right. So AB 360 has been extended to the end of the year. So through the, through December 31st. <clears throat> if But we have to renew every month if you guys want to continue. I thought it. they had changed, like folks could not comment on Zoom anymore. My understanding because is that the health orders not according to our legal. Our legal oh, counsel okay. said through the end of December. So yeah. the county has the county's legal team has said different things for county okay. bodies. So it's very okay. fun time to be in public office. Okay. Um, all in favor. Aye. Aye. Great. Now we will move on to resolution 2022 20, uh, 22 23 19 um, having to do with reducing or discontinuing discontinuing particular kinds of services by an additional 22.6 FTE for the 23-24 school year. Can I have someone present on this? Yep, so Jason, you yeah. have to be ready. Uh, so um, as, you, as you probably know, the PKS is not an elimination of these positions at this time. It means that we're considering the possibility of eliminations of those positions. Typically this is one of a couple reasons, um, funding changes is often one reason, um, declining enrollment could be another reason, sometimes programmatic changes are reasons, um, and this PKS allows us the flexibility to meet the competing interests of those different, different um, influences on our, on our system. An example of this, uh, for example, uh, one of the items on there, the reading specialists, um, were increased for they were they were half time at every school with the exception of McDowell had a full time and with when we got COVID funding as we moved through the pandemic we increased that by 3.0 while COVID funding has been decreasing and so um, that's why the 3.0 that we increased with COVID funding is on here because the funding has changed and so in order to so we'll need to be considering what other funding would helps to support those if we were to keep those positions at their current at their current level. Um, another example, you saw uh, the positions, um, we had a lot of FTE for specific subjects or elementary teachers, that's a, an example of declining enrollment as we did our enrollment calculations, when we've been in declining enrollment, that means less sections in our secondary schools, it means less elementary teachers, so that's why some of those, that's an example of why those positions are there. And then uh, a, a final example, for example, of programmatic interests, our BRTs were listed on here. Uh, our BRTs, our bilingual resource teachers serve our EL students. That isn't because we're decreasing our services to EL students. Actually, the opposite is true. We've discussed the need to um, increase our support for our EL students and to uh, support them in student achievement. Uh, in order for us to decide, is our current configuration, the one that we've had for a number of years, the most effective, or do we want to do something else? We need to put these positions on so we can consider redesigning it, or we might decide this is the best configuration and we're gonna to add to it, but we don't have that flexibility to um, redesign programs without putting a position like that on the table to have discussions about. Um, I think that covers most of it in terms of, of the scope of what we have on the PKS for this resolution. And I would just <clears throat> add, if we, if we just back up a little bit too, so this March 15th, you know, everyone hears the March 15th deadline for a public organization, a public agency. This is our, this is really our chance. These are temporary, these are, um, that's what I'm looking for, <laughs> not temporary. These are, these are, um, in order for us to have some flexibility and figure out what is it, what is, what kind of programs or what kind of positions are we wanting to look at and look at potentially decreasing, increasing, this is our chance to do it. We have to give notice. A PKS is not about a person, it's about a position. Um, so that you'll, you'll notice that on, on a PKS, you don't see a name attached to it. This is because these are certificated uh, reductions that we're looking at for positions. If people are in the position, they have bumping rights. There's all sorts of things that happen, but this is our opportunity to change and be flexible as a district and figure out how we work with the staff in some of those positions to figure out about what are what are what else can we be doing to to 
um, close the opportunity gap and certainly close this achievement gap that we're seeing even widening uh, post COVID. A lot of the funds, as Jason mentioned, are COVID funded. I remember um, a year and a half ago when I first started as superintendent, we got all this COVID money. It's like, what, this is wonderful. And then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, and in a, in a couple of years, you guys are going to all hate me because we're trying to cut some of these positions back because the, the COVID funding is running out. CSI funded positions, very similar. CSI money, we have uh, this comprehensive support um, for, for our high school, for our um, San Antonio and uh, Sonoma Mountain. Sonoma Mountain is actually not qualified for next year, just Sonoma Mountain, or just, I'm sorry, just San Antonio. And we're not even we're not even sure that we're going to be getting those funding the funding source next year. We've applied, they've accepted our application, but we haven't even we're not sure. So if if the funding comes back, then we can increase. Um, when I think about COVID funding going down, I also think about um, um, teacher or uh, educator effectiveness money. Go, you know, we we're getting educator effectiveness money. The governor has been talking about this four point seven billion dollar windfall to schools for mental health funding which I still haven't gotten a, a lot of information about, honestly. And um, so funding sources kind of come and go. A lot of these are tied to particular sorts of funding, uh, one-time funding sources, which is why they're on here. Anything else to add? I, I would just say, I think you were looking for the word preliminary. This is preliminary, preliminary yes, notice because we have a long way to go as we're planning for 2023, 24. A lot of information is very sketchy at best or we're waiting on information. Enrollment is, we know we're, we're working with the principals to try to identify how many students that we think we're gonna have next year. But just as a reminder, we used to have approximately 7,500 students. And at this time, we're well below 7,100. So even when we look at how we were projecting enrollment last year for this year, we're over 100 students down right now from where we were assuming we were gonna be when we were working with um, our teams in the spring. So unfortunately, when it comes to declining enrollment, we have to then um, start looking at reductions. Um, I would also just say with the COVID dollars, we are evaluating them to see how much funds are going to be left by the time we finish um, costing out everything we're gonna fund this year most of those funds had to be used by June, well, August 30th of 2023 this year. And then there are a certain number that we actually have an additional year of August, 2024. So that those are the funds that we're looking at. How do we continue leveraging those funds? So I would and say- there, And there are positions that we're continuing to fund with COVID for, as an example, uh, the student advisor. When we, when we received the COVID funding, we put a, student, a full-time student advisor, it's a classified position at each of our schools that we, you know, that's a very costly item. We're going to continue that. We have, you notice that that's not on the list. We're going to continue that in collaboration with our site administrators and they're in, they're in getting their input. That's a critical position that we feel um, that we want to continue with. Having an additional nurse in our district, critical. Having an additional psychologist. We have um, um, an additional, two additional LMFTs some of these mental health counseling positions that we're, ex by, by making some cuts now, we're able to extend some of the positions that we feel like we, we, we are, that are, are very critical uh, at this point in the year. So that's, that's where we're at. Any comments or questions? Go for it, board member Cloud. <laughs> Um, this is a really difficult um, resolution for me personally, um, and I've thought a lot about it since I saw the resolution, um, and a couple of things come up for me. Um, of the proposed cuts, um, the reading specialists, the bilingual resource teachers, and the point .4 um, CTE, I just... Um, I really have problems with cutting them, uh, not the proposed cuts, the preliminary possible cuts. Um, when I hear that you want to revise the bilingual resource teachers and the way that they're um, delivering the instruction, um, I applaud that, I think that's wonderful, but I would rather see that happen first and then put those resource teachers on, um, on this list 
Um, it's, I guess my objections are more philosophical than practical. Um, our dashboard results aren't great, um, particularly with our bilingual or our um, ELL students and our students with disabilities. I just can't in good conscience cut those positions or possibly cut those positions because to me, by putting, putting these on this list, it's saying that they're expendable. That, you know, if we have to, we will do it. I mean, when you say the um, student advisors on the campus are more important than a reading specialist, I have, I don't agree. Just personally, it's a philosophical uh, kind of issue for me. Um, so I just need to bring that up to everybody that in particular, those three things listed, I in good conscience can't vote for. Can I, can I just respond for this? Yeah. I also, I wanna be hyper clear. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not pitting one group against another saying that student advisors are more important than reading specialists. I think the reading specialists in my mind, it's a, it's a COVID, fund, COVID funded position. We knew this was a temporary. We know student advisors are temporary. You know, if we can eke out another year with our student advisors, great. The reading specialists, I also, we look at alternative funding sources and educator effectiveness money. Could We could use some of the, the learning, sorry, the learning recovery funds to pay for um, additional reading specialists or um, some sort of literacy specialists. We, we want to redesign and rethink what that looks like at each site. And so it's not about, in my mind, the reading specialists. I, I, I think the world of our reading specialists and our bilingual research teachers. And so putting them on there is not a value judgment and on my part, it's more of a how, a what other funding sources do we see that our, our district has right now that we could reassign some of the funding and reinvent what we're doing with that funding to support students. I just want you to understand that I understand that. And that it's, it's really just, I just can't do it. Actually, I agree with Maddie. I was shocked when I saw the BRTs on there. I don't, again, looking at our dashboard, I don't think we're in the position to lay off bilingual resource teachers. I just think that would be a mistake. And we talk about equity, we talk about approving, um, improving our EL students on the dashboard and in every way. And to take out the BRTs seems like we are working against ourselves, so. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I wanna acknowledge all the folks who came to speak on behalf of Valley Vista's childcare and I really appreciate that. And I suspect that each one of the, I know this on resolution number 20 and we're on 19, but these are both related. And, and the situation for both of them are the same. And so I just want to, um, you know, uh, there was a lot of expression of, this is an annual event that we do, sadly enough, that is a phenomenon of the uh, budget cycle, the timing of the budget cycle for the state with our obligations to our employees based upon our contracts with them about not proper notification for potential layoffs uh, and our own projections of what kind of revenues we can expect from the state based upon our enrollments. And so, we do this every year, uh, and the only time we wouldn't be doing it if is we were projecting increasing enrollments. It was a boom economy for the state, and then we would then we wouldn't have to do this kind of thing. But we do have to do this kind of thing because this is our uh, responsibility to keep this uh, district afloat. But I want to. But what I want to um, say about this is um, the this is just the opening volley. Somebody said please table this or we have to have a discussion with the with our sites this is the starting discussion of it it allows us the flexibility to do you know to protect our district and our schools fiscally while uh, carving out some time to to discuss and to advocate at the state level for funds at the at the um, at the district level we are um we are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, 
not beholden, but we're, uh, we are constrained by the uh, whatever the state can will provide for us. And we, I think people in this room know that public education in California is, has been severely underfunded for about 40, 50 years. Um, but, you know, we, uh, I, I would ask the folks uh, to help us advocate at the state level to increase the pie. That's the way we're gonna be able to keep uh, the employees that we want and to pay them at, with salaries that we want to pay them. But uh, uh, at the same time, we have to make this kind of flexibility for ourselves so that we can have the discussions and don't corner ourselves into a fiscal hole. Um, I understand all of the um, things that are holding us back and laying off the employees, but what if we do have to take this kind of action to release these employees, what, what is the plan for the students that, that need to have those, those resources, that, that need those adults to get them through school? What's that plan? And, and I think we're conflating, we're conflating two, two, board, two action items. The, if you, if, I think what you're, you're referring to is the Valley Vista child care. Are you referring to, because we're not talking, we're not talking about people on here. We're talking about positions. Is it the bilingual resource teachers? Yes, the bilingual, okay, that one. gotcha. <laughs> Sorry. So, so with this kind of resolution, so thinking about a bilingual resource teacher, when we ask our, our site principals about where do they want to see flexibility and kind of positions and how do we best support the students, the, we're looking for some flexibility in how we provide that. Do I want to cut uh, services to English learners? Absolutely not. I want to see more services, if, if anything, uh, geared towards our English learners. What does that look like? I think we need, I, this, is, this is our one opportunity as a board it, by March 15th to put, uh, put these positions on notice. So what does that look like? Well, it would be, um, and Esmeralda is going to come on and speak in a little bit, working with our bilingual research teachers, but working with our reading specialists, let's redesign and rethink this. Some, there are districts that, uh, so 10, 11, 12 years ago, we didn't, have a, we didn't have a position called bilingual research teachers. Lots of districts don't have bilingual research teachers. What do they have? They have other positions that do other, other things to support English learners. Reading specialists, it's the same, it's the same thing. Uh, instead of pulling students, small groups of students out of the classroom, maybe they're pushing in, maybe they're modeling instruction, maybe they're, co maybe they're um, looking, at, looking at data, maybe they're, they're you know, leading, some, leading staff meetings, they're working with students at different times of the day. There's all sorts of things that we can do. And so it would be working with that staff and figuring out where, where do we, and also looking at our data, what kind of positions are going, to, are going to best meet the needs of, of, of students? And so that's what this, as Sheldon put, opening volley is to say, we need to actually take a, a critical look at the positions that we're talking about right here. And, and either we may, we may decide, you know what, we don't have, just don't have the bandwidth to, to change anything right now. We're going, to, we're going to bring this back. Maybe we need more of, the, of a certain position. But it's our opportunity right now as a public institution to start having those conversations and making making appropriate changes. In my brain, from an equity lens, we see the same stuff in the dashboard year in and year out. And so why do we keep reinvesting in the same things? And that's not on that's not what I'm saying about staff. So how can we make positions that utilize our staff to the best of their abilities to meet our students at the best of our students' abilities? And so for me, I think of it as, yes, we're putting these positions on the table to work with them and make them better. Um, because yes, we need reading specialists and we need bilingual support. Those are, everyone on this board agrees with that. That's not what's up for debate. Great. It, but what does that look like is what is up for discussion. And so, I personally think if we're talking about equity, like we always talk that we are, um, we need to be looking at what works and what doesn't work and how can we best support our staff. And so if that means changing the title and changing the job description and they're still delivering services to our EL kids and now our EL kids are gonna get better test scores, like they're the in, same individual person's title might not be reading specialist or might not be bilingual resource teacher, but it doesn't mean that we're giving someone a pink slip tomorrow. That's my question. I mean, you are. Yes. So but, uh, 
it, it, is it correct what Caitlin says is that, and that what you're implying that the reading specialists and the bilingual resource teachers, we're gonna reconfigure how we're delivering our instruction and then possibly hire people that, I mean, I'm trying to understand the financial benefit of getting rid of this if we're just gonna rehire people. Um, is, so, but I could be misunderstanding this. I don't, I'm not talking about a financial benefit. The, for, well, I mean, we're well, conflating many of our positions. Because, so, of, because of our declining enrollment, because right. of not having enough money, these, these proposed uh, eliminations are on the list. So let, I mean, if we take one, we will actually take one at a time. So if we think about reading specialists, right? Three year, four years ago, every school, Mike McDowell had a full-time reading specialist. Every other school had a half-time reading specialist. That's how it, it was probably for a decade in my, whole, my entire time here. We got COVID funding, right? And this additional one-time funding and we said, woohoo, let's, we, we're, we were, it was very last minute plan. We said, let's just increase and give some additional services at each school site. So we raised every single, every, every one of our seven elementary schools got a full-time reading specialist. Wonderful. COVID funding is starting to, is, is our COVID funding is dwindling. So our COVID funding is dwindling. So what we put on here is the COVID funded, the additional 3.0 FTE COVID funded reading specialists we're proposing that that the COVID, we, we don't have enough money to sustain every single COVID funded position for another year. We just don't have the money to do it. So that's what's going away. Other one time, you know, as a, as a public institution, we keep getting these additional pots of money. So educator effectiveness is one. Uh, learning recovery block grant is another one. Learning recovery block grant is another place where I can see and we can see as a cabinet, um, potentially bringing back some of the, some of the um, reading specialist services or, or reinventing that and working with the reading specialist to say, how is it, you know, let's, let's talk about what's, what's going on, what's the best practice and how do we bring it back? Our readings, we have some phenomenal reading specialists. There's, there's no doubt. I mean, I, I know some of these people very personally, and this is not a personal attack or a personal, I, I think the world of them and I think that we, we need to meet, this is, again, this is preliminary notice that we need to look at, take a look at these positions and see, is this really, is this the best use of our one-time money that we're going to get from the state, from a learning recovery block perspective? And if it is, great. What do we need? We can start to have these conversations and then bring different, you know, maybe it is the reading specialists that we need. Maybe we need more of them. I don't know if our lead, our learning recovery blog grant is going to make give us more than that, but it, it's not a it's not a again it's not a um, it's not a critique of a of a certain position. It's a let's let's take a look at what we're what services we're offering to these school sites. Um, Jason or Tony, do you or or Maite, you want to add anything? Um, I, I I think this I, I see this as just a really good opportunity. Um, to look at what we're currently doing and to see how we can can improve what we're doing. We're adding a lot of systems in place, and this is a great opportunity to see what where those systems need additional support to get the the uh, you know the achievement level where we want it to be. So if you know if the COVID funding um, is expiring and we have the opportunity to look at other ways to support what we're do, what the COVID funding positions have been supporting but in, in perhaps in a more targeted or specific way based on the systems that we're putting in place based on the data that we're seeing, then I think it's a great opportunity for us to have that conversation, to explore other opportunities to provide those supports um, and to potentially reposition some of those um, uh, targeted supports that we're seeing maybe with their like, for example, with a reading specialist to something that, that can be much more targeted or much more uh, aligned to the systems that we're putting in place. Other positions, such as the the you know, I think you brought up the CSI uh, TOSA. We've applied for additional CSI funding. Are we guaranteed that we're going to get it? No, not yet. When if we once we receive the additional funding, then we can go back and say, okay, hey, this is how much money we've received, and here's how let's let's collaborate and figure out a way. How are we going to how are we going to spend it to support the schools and target the students who actually 
the, for the you know the reason that we 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 qualified for that money it could be graduation rates it could be whatever whatever it, it was that we applied for i just think this was all of our worst fears come true right this covid money yeah. that we create these positions and then we knew that down the road we were going to have to reduce them um so it's really frustrating um i mean that's why we you know go to Sacramento every year, why we went to Washington last year, like to beg for more money or to keep the COVID money going. Um, I don't know if, if they are all hearing us in DC and Sacramento, it doesn't feel like it. Um, but in terms of the reading specialist, I mean, two meetings ago, we were looking at um, the school accountability report cards, like you mentioned, like the scores. And we were like, what, what do we need to do differently? It's like, we can't continue to see these and not um, not change something like we see numbers like 5% or 8% pass rates or 0% pass rates at some schools. Like we do have to do something differently. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that a year from now we'll see something different um, while not reducing services, but keeping them or increasing. So, I mean, at some point, um, you know, we have to pivot on what we're doing and I respect your opinion and thank you for voicing that, so. Me too. Any other comments or questions on 2223-19 about reducing or discontinuing services by 24.6? Did you say Esmeralda had a comment? Uh, for the next the next item. Oh, okay. Caitlin, so, can I just add one yeah. more thing to, to Maddie's point? I, I think our intention in terms of, of you know, specifically the reading specialists and the BRTs, um, and we've already been in communication with them and Matthew and I were emailing with one of them. Our intention is just to collaborate with them on what that looks like and, and how we increase and, and maintain those services. It's just about an opportunity to think differently about how we serve our students. I guess that's what I'm, that's what I'm, questioning and trying to figure out not questioning really I trust you I know that that's I think it's a great idea I'm I'm wondering though what how eliminating these positions further that you know if you if you indeed want to still provide the types of services from the reading specialists and the bilingual resource teachers but you're taking away almost six positions. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how that works. If you leave the positions in there, wouldn't it be more likely that you'll be able to um, have the staff to be able to transition into a new look or a new type of delivery? Does that make sense? That does make sense. I think um, going back to Sheldon's point about this being just the opening conversation and the idea that, that if we if we pull those off, then we're committing to keeping the programs the same. You know, why it just it just has are they particularly, you know, the, their responsibilities and those teaching positions are and, and, outlined to that degree. Well, and we might and we might as we as we work together, we might decide that that we do need to keep them the same, where we don't, you know, that we aren't needing to change those. But it allows us the chance to have conversations and dialogue about what okay. what we need to do to meet the needs of students. So okay. that's the, that's certainly the intention on it. Yeah, thank you. I and, understand. And I think to the the bottom line. <clears throat> We put we we on the resolution we added. No, this is this is COVID funded. So many of them are categorically funded, and it, it's like we don't have enough money in our bank account in that fund to pay for all of these positions. And so we have to make some decisions. Those decisions have consequences. I I totally understand that, and we're also kind of you know st very strategically looking at what other funding sources do we have have coming in. COVID is dwindling. We're able to extend out nurses, LMFT, some things that we just don't think that we can cut right now. How am I going to come here and say, we're going to cut an LMFT? I mean, people would, what are you talking about? So, but we know that COVID funding is running out. What other buckets of money do we have? We have learning recovery block grant right now that can come in and backfill some of these positions. So 
that's that's really what's on the table for many of the positions, not all of them, but but many of them. That's just, which is why I put which one is what with a specific funding source. Yeah. And to be clear, the timing on this is handed down from the state. It's not March fifteenth. If we yes. if we if it came if it was up to us, we could decide we could eliminate positions at the exact same time that we create new positions. But because of understand laws about transparency, people needing to know about their jobs for next, like the, I think the law from the state is probably very well intentioned, but it creates a lot of chaos for us because we don't know exactly what our financial picture is gonna look like next year. Right, and again, these are positions, not people. So the people who are in the positions will have, there are bumping rights. It's not like we're saying you're losing your, your job. We, are, we would work with our employees to make sure that they had they were continuing on in a position. Um, do our student board members have any other questions or thoughts? Cool. Um, we moved and seconded, I believe. No. Okay. Well, then somebody needs to make a motion. I move to approve resolution twenty two twenty three dash nineteen. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? You have to turn your camera. I mean, your. I oppose. I abstain. The resolution carries. So we will move on to resolution 2223-20. Um, and it sounds like we have maybe a presentation from Esmeralda before we start pestering people with questions. Yeah, if, if that's okay with the with board, I, I've invited um, Esmeralda and JJ Lynch there in the, in the, uh, on the panel here in, on Zoom. And I've asked them just to give a little bit of background about, I, I think it's important because I, I, I hear, thank you so much all for being here and, and the care. I, I actually know Nancy myself, she's wonderful. I, I, it's, this is not a personal thing. I wanna talk a little bit about the ELOP funding. So typically, you know, in the past we've had, um, so just to kind of put this in, in a little bit of context, we've had um, a childcare program that as former principal at McKinley, I used to run as well. And um, wonderful people, wonderful program, et cetera, et cetera. Valley Vista, wonderful program over at Valley Vista. I've heard great things about it, how it attracted students. We This past year, we just received um, an, a, a very large ongoing um, source of funding. And it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't say it's called childcare, it's called Extended Learning Opportunities Program. Chris, I think it's one point. 1.7 million dollars per year to fund extended learning opportunities for our students. And so when we look at in, in this what's quote unquote ELOP program, it is the intention of this of this money from the state coming down to us is to provide high quality before and after school child care. Not to say that that's not happening now, and at, at, at affordable rates that have strict guidelines for use of this money. Um, and so that's why I wanna invite, uh, with, with kind of a little bit of that background, we have two programs right now. So the, the seven elementary schools that we have, five of them have programs that are, are run by we either Champions, Boys and Girls Club, or uh, what the YMCA. McKinley and Valley Vista are the only, the, the only remaining district run childcare programs that we have in existence. And they are both specific to the TK and kindergarten. They also both have, Valley Vista has champions that's come in to, to serve uh, over at Valley Vista. And McKinley has, has, since I can never remember, has had Boys and Girls Club as well. So that kind of puts it into a little bit of context for us. This ELOP money is brand new this year. And so I wanted I want to invite Esmeralda and JJ just to talk about the scope of the money, what we're doing, what the planning is behind it, the rationale. And, um, and then when they're done, I want to come back and just talk a little bit specifically more about the people that are involved in this too. So Esmeralda and JJ, I'm going to let you two take it over. Sure, thank you um, for having us on tonight and sharing a little bit about the Expanded Learning Opp Opportunities Program. Um, as you all know, JJ Lynch joined us um, uh, last spring and has been working feverishly in preparing um, our RFPs, working with our program partners, the current ones that we've had, um, and his um, 
working on all things ELOP in terms of compliance and requirements. So I just want to invite her to speak a little bit about the work that has been happening and specifically those changes um, that are related to some of the some of the changes with childcare versus expanded learning opportunities. Uh, thank you, Esmeralda. Uh, I just really want to honor all the speakers because that was very touching and um, I just appreciate that input. So um, about the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, this is, uh, a, I noticed Matthew didn't call it a grant. Thank you, Matthew, because it's not a grant. <laughs> this is um, a funding stream um, based on the funding formula. So this was not an optional thing for any district in the state. And with this funding uh, come some pretty strict parameters. Um, per the ED code, I think it's 46120, um, one of the intentions of the funding um, that we will be, and this funding stream is also subject to the federal program monitoring. So we do get audited on this, just like other categoricals. Um, the districts are encouraged to collaborate with community-based organizations, especially those participating in state or federally subsidized childcare programs um, is one of the requests and the intent of the legislation. There's also a number of programmatic, um, requirements for school year programming, we're required to offer a nine hour day to students inclusive of the school day. Um, that can be before school, after school. So we had to look at the bell schedules. Um, for those 30 non-school days, we also need to provide and offer a nine hour day. We are mandated to provide 30 non-school days of nine hour programs at a lot of our sites. Um, we are we we are required to have minimum staff um, education requirements. They must meet the district's instructional assistant um, requirements. We have to provide structured academic offerings as well as enrichment as well as a physical component. These are all things that we will be audited on. Um, so I guess in saying that, there's been a lot of work put in this year to um, take a look at what's happening and what's going on. I think that, um, again, I just wanna honor the people who are speaking. Um, obviously you guys know I could do a really long presentation on this because I uh, love it, but I can open it up to questions. Do any of you have a question? I'm sure. I have. Or any, yeah, anything remotely related to the resolution? Well, I I think just before before we let you off the hook there, um, JJ and Esmeralda, <clears throat> I also hear this, you know this lots and lots you know this emo emotions about the program as a former principal at mckinley my own kids went through the child care program at mckinley i have they're wonderful amazing people for me it's not um and i want to get to the people in, in a second because it you know again we talk about bumping rights in our district and and trust when we when we say we would find a place or find it somewhere for our, our people to land that's exactly what we would do in this situation for me, it's more about this, this $1.7 million of ongoing funding. And I hear the concern too about the, you know, the, the cost the, you know, I heard multiple of our, of our speakers today talking about the cost of the program and champions is difficult to, to deal with, with the cost, the cost, the cost. So I want to hear from JJ a little bit more about the cost and how families can access, uh, you, you know, paying for this kind of program. We just went out for an RFP a request for proposals. What does that look like? The ability to have you know, a simultaneous program at McKinley and Boys and Girls Club or Champions or YMCA or whatever it is, the, the ability to have a, a simultaneous program at Valley Vista for the TK and the kindergarten and, and then a simultaneous pr program, whatever, whatever group we, we decide to partner with. 
it may be one group that comes and does all the, the work for the entire district. It might, we may have two or three um, groups that we bring in and, and, and different. So it's really, this is the time right now where we're shifting the way that we're looking at before and after uh, care programs for our students and, and it, using this funding, because I do, I, I, I feel the pain, it's, you know, parents say, I only need it for a couple hours. What's the, the flexibility as well in the program? So I just want to hear a little bit more about this, JJ, from, from where you're sitting, because it's all brand new and we're, I know we're going to get audited on this. And so I want to make sure that we're in compliance and that we're able to serve all of our students, regardless of income. Uh, so I want to hear a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So um, a part of the mandate is that our district offer, I'm going to air quote, offer access to all unduplicated students. This funding is specifically for our unduplicated students to access before, after, and non-school days. Um, we did that in the form of, uh, we have an expanded learning website under the Ed Services Department as well as inserted um, some components of ELOP into the data confirmation, the back to school data confirmation. So it actually, we went above and beyond and offered to all families this access um, by letting them know about it. Um, every, also in the Ed Code, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to look at this note. The Ed Code is really long and hard. I should have pulled it out. Um, any fee-based program uh, that we, give or grant ELOP funding to, to serve our unduplicated students. If they are a fee-based program, they must provide fees on a sliding scale um, or have another source of financial aid for students. So um, I did the research and checked with Champions. I do know that they have an internal financial aid component for families um, so we have the ELOP funding that can scholarship families in. There's also an internal financial aid um, component in Champions structure. So I just double checked with them um, to make sure that we were in compliance because they will be required. And they, they said that they work with families and I've witnessed them this year working with families individually based on their income needs and levels. Um, and I took some mad notes today from some of the speakers as well. Was that good, Matthew? Is that did I get did I get all your points? I have a question yeah. about this. So, what will this program look like? Like, what's the start and end time specifically? Is it going to be throughout the school year? I keep hearing about expanded learning. It's going to be um, like during breaks and things. But is it also going to be during the regular school year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's happening now. So it, it is, I mean, the expanded learning is just these before and after school programs that were already running in Petaluma City Schools, by the way. So they were running before ELOP. What ELOP has uh, allowed us to do this year um, as we kind of figure out how, by the way, the audit tool for ELOP has not been released by CDE. So they are expecting us to build the house while we live in it because we also must serve children. Um, and so we, I truly believe that our practices are, are informing the CDE on that audit tool. So it's happening now. Um, after school programs were scholarshiping kids into the after school program. So kids that couldn't access the after school program at their school sites before can access them now. Um, we have been running non-school day sessions over Thanksgiving break, winter break. We've got a two-week spring break coming up and uh, planning a very comprehensive summer program. So our, our, goal, our goal for the program is how do we take, you know, looking at the calendar, how do we take these one-week blocks where families you know, family may be working, parent, or parents may be working, students are there. How do we ensure that we have to, we now have to provide at least 30, if we can do more than 30, great, of intercession slash summer school. Um, but I think th the question that I wanna hear a little bit more about JJ, I know we, you and I haven't even had a chance to, um, to confirm this, but really is the ability to 
having one, uh, two programs at the same school site. So for example, Valley Vista or McKinley having a, a program for TK in kindergarten and running, uh, I, I guess I, I assume it's a TK through sixth grade program because the part of the, the history is some of these, the, the programs that we had, for example, Boys and Girls Club, they wouldn't take TK and kindergarten students, which is why we, which is why we created that. Um, you know, to have to make sure that we were serving. Now, my understanding is from the from the RFP that we're doing, it's not a it's not it's a requirement that they serve all students. And what I want to make sure is our students at Valley Vista and our students at McKinley are getting the same service. So, if you're a kindergartner at McKinley or Valley Vista, that you're getting the same number of you're getting the same programming as a student at Grant or Pengrove. That you're getting all the school days. You have the app before before care option, the aftercare option, and those 30 plus additional days for intercession and summer school. I want to make sure that there's equity from that standpoint as well. So right now, the district run programs are only during the school day. We're not running intercessions in summer school with our program. And so that for me is the, the crux of the kind of the conundrum is I want to make sure that our, all of the students have the same opportunities in all those intercessions and having the hours before care, the after care, et cetera. So my question is, is there, could we run two programs, one at those, the, those schools that have those kind of grandfathered in programs and run an ELOP program on the same site? Uh, the intent of the legislature was to have one comprehensive expanded learning program on a school site. They did not intend the ELOP funds to create uh, parallel programs on a school which could, in some circumstances, increase an equity gap um, at certain sites. And I think, um, you know, that's what why they that's why they recommended that within the ed code. So when you say that we're already running these programs in our district, is this money funding those programs who like, I, I don't understand. I the guess. money is um, this year scholarshiping undo homeless students, foster students, English language learners and socioeconomically disadvantaged students, scholarshiping them into the after school and before school programs and scholarshiping them into those nine hour intercession programs. So, and where the funding not only increases the amount of students that each site can serve, but it is also, it's not meant, it's only not only meant to broaden our reach, but also deepen the programmatic quality. So when we go to visit sites, there are certain parameters. Each, each organization is held accountable to a CQI process. That's what we've been exploring this year as do, do, does Boys and Girls Club have an internal CQI process um, that they can document and provide data for, or is this something that we need to work on with them uh, to bring them up to compliance? Because these are, these are pieces of evidence that we will need to provide to the CDE analysts that come and visit us, um, is proof of collaboration, proof of collaboration with public entities, proof of collaboration with the school day, with the regular school day, proof of alignment, uh, proof of academic enrichment and physical components that are structured. So, so in other words, yeah. The, I'm, so in other words, I'm we questions. yeah. So <laughs> slow down, JJ. Sorry, I told you I nerd <laughs> out. On this. So, so this year, this is the first year that we received you know this one point seven million dollars ongoing funding. What are we doing? With it? Well, we've already have programs in place at all of our school sites, including Valley Vista and McKinley for the the the, the, the TK and kindergarten child care. We have champions. We have YMCA. We have Boys and Girls Club. What we're using the money for this year is we are scholarshipping some quite a few, a large number of students um, into the program so that they're right and, and using those funds. This year right now is a non audit year. It's the first year everyone's got to pass. So we're doing we're sort of seeing how we can how, what, what we can do with the program. Same thing with, you know, this year we, we added some days at uh, Thanksgiving break, winter break, we're gonna be adding days at spring break, summer, summer break as well. Next year is really when this starts to we're, we're going to start looking at being audited for how we're how we're doing it. We just 
did an RFP request for proposals mm -hmm. for for organizations. Chris, do you want to talk a little about that that pro, that program or the? Wait, can I just yeah, clarify? Sure. <laughs> so we're not really running our own programs. We're just paying for students to go to the programs that exist. Exactly. Okay, but, so we're not. But, and and JJ is starting to get into and overseeing because there's a quality control that we need to do. Make sure making sure that the programs that we have mm -hmm. are meeting certain requirements. Are they do do they all have a nine hour day? Are they, do they have the staffing to student ratios that are, is required? Is the food meeting the, the requirements that, ha, that has to be all these different requirements that are, do the mm -hmm. staff all have, meet the minimum requirements in, in, um, for, for the grant? So there's all this work that's going on behind the scenes to get ready for it. Yeah, I mean, to your point, we, it was supposed to be 600,000 this year. They increased it from 600 to 1.7 million in when we found got the budget in July. And so they knew this was an implementation year and that a lot of the, every district in the state of California was having to try to figure this out. Right. So yes, we already had partners in place at every single, single school site. And so what we came up with was the scholarship idea so that we could have students get access at an affordable rate while tapping into the community-based partners that we already had. I think JJ said something that's really key which is, it's kind of the intent of the legislation that we are partnering with community-based partners. So when you say we're not running our own, that is true. We're not running an ELOP program in-house, but that's not necessarily the intent of the legislation either. The intent of the legislation is for us to partner with these community-based organizations to create these programs that will meet all these guidelines, improve or create a more robust academic extended learning opportunities, not just childcare. And so it, it's been complicated and the state has, you know, the guidelines have been as clear as mud in some, in some cases. And that's why the audit guidelines are written. Just to clarify a few, few things, McKinley and um, McDowell had the Boys and Girls Club. They did not support Kinder and then, right. and then TK because the ACES program mm -hmm. that operated those was only a first through sixth grade program. And that's why the whole overlay of trying to support TK and K came about because we needed to get those students served as well and ACES did not serve them. ELOP is an overlay to ACES. And so basically ACES continues, but the ELOP comes in and creates this overlay to make the entire program more robust and make it TK through sixth grade. And it's only TK through six, there is no junior high component. So you're absolutely right. We are kind of building the houses, we're living in it. Um, our partners are also going through a lot of growth because they have to learn all these regulations as well. We went out for an RFP, I wanna say in December, January timeline to kind of say, okay, here are the criteria and the requirements for ELOP. And then had our community-based partners then pro submit proposals on how they're gonna operate the program and at what cost, because we're also looking at how do we how do we make sure that this is affordable for our families and that they're, they're complying with um, this notion that it is to provide access for our most vulnerable students, our free and reduced, our foster youth, et cetera. I would also add that as an added complication, the YMCA owns the buildings at both Grant and at McNear. Yeah, yeah. And so they actually have their own buildings on our property on, on leases or land leases. So that's added a level of complexity. We're still working with those with that organization to say, hey, we still need to operate ELOP and you're still gonna to have to comply with these guidelines. So it may look a little different next year for sure. Um, hopefully we can streamline it and make it easier access for our parents financially yes. so that they can not get the level of confusion and, and, um, and lack of clarity, lack of communication from those community-based partners. And I think that's why JJ was taking mad notes about that. Um, and I do think the challenge of how do we operate two programs, one in-house and one that's a community-based organization is, is challenging under this ELO program, this ELOP program. I, I don't just, know if that answered your question or not, Joanna, but. I just, we heard some, real valid complaints about champions tonight. Um, so my question is, is that, okay, so they offered this nine hour day. If parents don't need that nine hour day, 
champion is saying, well, just leave your kid here longer and your hours are cheaper. I mean, it, that I, I was appalled when I heard that. So what is the responsibility for parents who don't need that much, that many hours? I mean, mm-hmm. are, are, I, I was just really appalled. So if champion saying you have to pay for the full nine hours or whatever it is, even and- if you don't need it, I think I I'm going to jump in, Jay yeah. Jang, jump in for a second. I, I completely agree. And that is in part what has been so amazing about the Valley Vista childcare is that they're, they've been the anomaly, the majority, if not all child-based organizations, whether it's YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club, they do charge a flat rate because they have to cover their staffing. We've been super fortunate at Valley Vista to have the program that Miss Nancy, as I know her, um, runs at Valley Vista and they've been able to to make it work on a pay as you go or pay as you're served basis. But that's that's super atypical because most community-based organizations don't work. That's not a champion's particular issue. That's that's a that's a that's a um, an issue with almost every provider that we have. So I don't know if that answered your question or not. We we certainly need to work through some of these issues. There's absolutely no doubt. And I don't know that we've resolved everything. So when you go out for the proposal request, is that going to be part of it? Like offering hourly? I mean, I know there's this, you have to offer a sliding scale, but is that going to be part of what we're asking for, for these new folks who potentially might be running the programs at the school sites? JJ, I don't, I don't recall because we we did the RFP specifically for summer school. Is that right? The RFP process uh, had a dual purpose. One was to uh, find an organization to recommend for summer, and the other one was to get a pool of um, approved vendors to then have that conversation. I would say that uh, an hourly component for an expanded learning program is not the norm, but I do believe that it should be a part of the conversation for those fee-based families, right? Um, ELO P families who qualify for the scholarships won't be paying, but for those sliding scale families or the families that are paying in a fee-based program, um, it will be a part of my discussion with our providers to um, see if we can have flexibility and that could, you know, that'll be a part of the discussion and the decision-making process. Can I ask how, um, so you pay for um, the Valley Vista childcare um, and it's an hourly, how much of that covers the cost for the childcare services for Valley Vista? It is a great question. And it has fluctuated from year to year. There have been years where it's been more challenging to cover the cost. And there have been years that um, it's happened, you know, I I would say it's been more in the black. So it has been inconsistent from at least the accounting that I've seen. But there also was some challenges with how some of the operating, you know, worked pre-pandemic. And then of course we hit the pandemic. So to give you exact amounts, I'd have to go back and look. I, I haven't yeah. looked at it yeah. from that perspective um, since prior to the pandemic. So really, I guess, I guess what I'm, my question, I guess, is, is that, but also then the reason that this, that the child care is on this list is because of the ELOP. Yes. Exactly. Well, and I would also okay. clarify, because it's really two school sites on this. Yeah. McKinley has struggled much more to cover the costs. Valley Vista was able to cover the costs more regularly than McKinley. So when we were looking at it, we were looking at the various schools. Um, So it wasn't consistent even between the two schools. But but Maddie, just, I mean, yeah, to to accentuate that point, it's not it, having having the the two programs on here is not about, it's not a reflection of, we don't think they're doing a good job or we don't think there's, to the contrary, we. this is about a new funding stream that's coming into the district and our responsibility to provide equitable access to all of our students to a nine hour day to 30 plus additional days of, of, of 
extent, exp expanded learning opportunities. Um, and the cost for a lot of our students, our unduplicated students are gonna, is gonna be zero. Um, and then we'll have a sliding scale for the rest. I understand the attachment. I, I you know, I'm attached to my, to my program as well. It's, it is my question. And I, that's why I asked one to ask, you know, to clarify from JJ, if we could even have two side-by-side -side programs anymore with ELOP and my understanding was, and is that that's a problem for, at least for the intent of the, leg of the, of the legislation, but I don't know, JJ, if, if that's, if, if, is that, is that what you're saying? Is that what I'm understanding? <clears throat> that is what you're understanding. I'm going to try not to talk so much. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that is, that is the intent is that there's one single comprehensive program on a school site rather than two parallel programs. Um, I think, I believe this is not written down anywhere. I believe that they specifically put that in the ed code uh, because they really wanted to move away from any um, uh, just negative comparison or stigmatization of one program of or or another. Their intent is that all the funding streams are braided into one program, and they I just that's my understanding. And I think another question with this RFP, we're we're selecting. We could have. And as Chris pointed out with YMCA at McNear and Grant owning the buildings, we could have multiple uh, partners. One, I mean, obviously to have one partner per site, like could be YMCA, could be Champions, could be Boys and Girls Club. And we don't, we're not just saying we're gonna go with one or the one that provides us the lowest cost. It's, it's really about what, what works for each school site. Is that right? And what will that decision process be to decide for each school site? Um, what we're looking at is, uh, well, how, you know, the, the intent this year is how are the programs doing now? Um, are, are they able to meet the needs of the students? Um, I've had one-on-ones with principals around their vision. I'll check in occasionally to see what's going on. Um, and pushing into these programs and doing some classroom observations around programmatic quality because they can put what they want on their website or on paper. Um, uh, that's the process now. And then we'll be meeting with the ed services, with the leadership team uh, to develop some parameters and, um, you know, start doing some intensive conversations with the people that became approved vendors. Can I would, we, sorry, no. can we build in like intentional community parent outreach um, into the decision making for each school site? Like, I think that there are some sites that will do that by themselves, but can we as the district ensure that each of our sites are actively reaching out to people that are already in childcare will be using the services? Yes, it's that's how it should be yes and then um what about these positions are i mean i know we say it's positions not people but i mean obviously we yeah, all get attached to our child care workers um well and if we're not offering child there's no position to bump them to like i i know one of these people very well and i don't she does, she wants to work in childcare. So it doesn't matter if she has 30 years seniority. Great. Jason? <clears throat> As Matthew mentioned earlier, like we, we would be working if we would be working with all of our staff to find safe landing places for them. I mean, we, we, these are positions, but we do want to make sure that we're working to find um, spots for our staff. So part of that would be a conversation and moving forward to looking what options we have. And I mean, I think, you know, I can think of multiple options, right? I mean, perhaps, and not that we'd want to lose an, as, a, as a district employee, but perhaps the, 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 you know, the partner 
they'd want to be have a position or maybe even a leadership position in it with with that partner i also think about within the district i mean we are we are right now have a have a massive need for instructional assistance be in the classroom with students during the day so there are there are other positions that we can look at for mat, trying to match skill sets with with the staff so <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Anything from my student board members? I'm just wondering from like an equity focus, even if we don't employ child care people, is there a way for us to augment the staffing to make sure that at our schools that have higher percentages of uh, unduplicated students, oh my God, um, that we could have like a 0.5 FTE staff who's a Petaluma City school staff who works with the partner or is half funded by the partner and half funded by us. I mean, I think it's that, like Valley Vista's program draws people to that school. So I don't wanna lose the, the impact of having our own staff on the sites. Especially since I'm not sure which comments are said, you know, they build relationships with them on the playground or in the classroom, and it's really great and beneficial to have them there after school as well. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about students having an adult they can trust, right. and it sounds like at Valley Vista, it's those people. So, I, you know, I'm really torn about this. I understand the funding, but at the same time, you know, to, to cut a program that draws people to a school that's struggling and to cut a program that develops those staff student relationships that we want to see, I'm, I'm just having a really hard time with that. Me too. I know. And I have to echo that. Um, I, I had that thought, somebody brought it up, how, you know, the kids know, uh, know the staff, they uh, go to them, they trust them. And our one of our number one goals is that our, all of our students have a trusted adult on campus. And it sounds like at Valley Vista, that's the childcare, they, they start there, they trust them. And it, 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 I struggle with it, you know, because, you know, obviously I can't be a CEO, I keep, and that trust, <laughs> that trust continues past TK yeah. kindergarten. So the kids, first grade, second grade, they see them on, on the playground and that's their person. So I don't know what the answer is, but I'm not sure that cutting the Valley Vista Child Care Program is the right answer at this point. Yeah, and as someone who went to Valley Vista for kindergarten through what was it, third grade? Um, I'll be honest, I did not have a great relationship with all of the staff there on campus, especially the teachers, but um, I knew that every Wednesday I could go over to that little shack and have the time of my life in that sandpit. Um, so I would just I would just hate to see a future where that's not available, a, a future where um, kids can't have that outlet that I had and I know that it hasn't always been like hasn't always been there, but I, I want to keep it there. So, so Caitlin, your question is around getting creative. Is there, with is there a money. way? Is there a way to have like a liaison or someone yeah. at the school at those two school sites? Like, still, I mean, but, if we yeah, we talk about equity and what I mean, I'm talking about this because parents from Valley Vista brought it up. Valley Vista, McDowell, McKinley, like that's where so much need is and California has I think it's the lowest it's definitely in like the bottom five adult to student ratio already mm -hmm. so literally just having another grown-up body on campus I mean I know we can't afford it at every site but if we are moving towards using ELOP funds which I think we are and we have to and it makes sense um I feel like that's a way to keep some of the PCS flavor and site flavor and love in those in those spaces where 
I mean, as much as we can audit it as much as we want, but we don't have control over what our community partners do. We either can renew the contract or not if they're right. meeting it or not. I, I honestly think that if we work with Valley Vista, um, Jamie, who's here and, and the and the team, I think that I think that there actually are some creative things that we can look at to come up with some sort of happy medium in order to maintain um, some level of what this has provided for the school. I mean, I know that Valley Vista is looking at starting a Lego lab that we're very excited or they're very excited about. It. I'm excited about it too. Um, I mean, I, I think that there are some real opportunities. I really do. And I think that if we work together with Jamie and her team and kind of start exploring, how can we take a look at what has been super successful at this child care program and um, and apply it in as a as an add on. I, th I think that we can come up with something that will maintain the integrity of the beauty of what has been brought and is there right now. Um, but maybe it's not called childcare. I don't know. But I, I think that there we have opportunities to do that. I, I really do. And this is preliminary notice. So I mean, I think that we can work with Jamie. We can come up with something that actually um, can be really innovative and, and provide um, the team that currently works in that child care the opportunities to continue work with staff and for the kids to continue to have access um, to what those those staff members provide. So I, I do think that there's some opportunities for us to look at. So to I, be clear, this is also preliminary because I don't see that word in the, uh, the resolution. In the resolution. In the yeah, I don't, it doesn't read as preliminary. So yeah, it does. I need like a pinky promise that it's, <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> Well, the yeah, classified, this is, we're, we're also, I mean, this is a new thing. We never right. had to give March 15th notices to classified. It was always a 60 day notice. Um, but I believe the intent is that we can rescind these as well. So I, I think there's still the opportunity for that. I don't know if you want to add anything, Jason. But... No, I, that's, you're right, Chris. That's my understanding as well. And it talks about that we can um, reduce or discontinue. I mean, there's some flexibility in there. So what where it is preliminary is my understanding as well that makes okay. sense remember like now i remember that the legislation just passed yeah. last year and it now i'm classified. remembering all the conversations about it sorry so they have the it, same classified has the same march 15th march 15th yes. may 15th it and that's never a new, was before but and right. that's a new law so typically we gave 60 days oh so if we were looking at classified reductions in the past we would be coming to in april but because the legislation passed and now we have to give um, classified and certificate both March 15th. I just want to say one more thing about, I heard no, I heard nobody talk about how attached their kids are to the people that run champions. Okay. I just want to point that out that they're, I don't, I don't know anything about it. I know boys and girls club and that's about it. Um, but from what I've heard, I'm not real impressed with champions at the moment. <laughs> Well, I would just add that my grandson is in Miss Nancy's morning and aftercare, and he loves Miss Nancy. And I'll never forget going and picking him up, and she had cored an apple, and it had like, like it hadn't even fallen apart. And he was just so proud of that apple, and actually wanted to try an apple because she had done that. So, I mean, I Miss Nancy has done; she really is amazing with the kids, and I know my grandson loves her so. Jason, I just want to verify what you just said. So the corollary of, of this being a preliminary uh, notice is that if we don't approve it, we are committed to these positions for the next fiscal year. Correct? That, that is correct. So similar to what we discussed in the last resolution, it, um, it allows us to have conversations about uh, how we want to move forward. So when, if and when we do give these notices, can we please make that as, not as clear as mud, like as clear as crystal mountain water <laughs> when we talk to staff? Yeah, yes, we can. can so I, ha I have a proposal that we, um, that we table, or what is it? Take the child care assistant director from Valley Vista and the child care assistant from Valley Vista off the resolution. So you're moving to amend the yes. resolution to yes. strike child care assistant 
um, yes. for Valley Vista and director for Valley Vista, not necessarily McKinley. Yes, um, given the fact that they do, I mean, to have some plan for it, it seems like the amount of money. Um, I know that that this uh, this new funding is complicating it because it, it, they're supposed to be K, TK through six. So, but um, I don't know. I just think that this needs more time for me. So that's um, and also the amount of money that this is going to um, well save or or that. Uh, that we have to expend on those two positions. So first seem... I'm gonna see if there's a second for okay. your That's, I'm move just explaining. To yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Is there a second for this motion? Uh, second. Oh. Okay, now we can discuss this amendment. My feedback would be that if we're gonna strike the two at Valley Vista, we should also strike the one at McKinley. Um, I, I agree. That, being said, I still, I'm very, I'm conflicted, but I think that now that I understand that it is preliminary and not immediate, permanent, whatever, um, I'm more interested in having these conversations about flexibility and having conversations about how we can keep our adults in the partner daycare, childcare centers. Um, so I'm, I can be convinced either way right now. And our next board meeting is technically before March 15th, but cutting it pretty close. So yeah, yeah, it's cutting it very close, which is why I said that they're cutting it. Um, does anyone have any comments on? So that's my comment is if you're gonna strike, I would strike three instead of two. Um, so I will, we, what we are discussing right now is the amendment to strike the two Valley Vista positions from the resolution. I would just speak against the proposed amendment. Uh, I, don't, I, I have trust in our staff. Um, I mean, <laughs> our environment is changing and we have to change with our environment. Something is going to be on that list uh, and, and it's not gonna be <laughs> easy, uh, but as long as we, you know, we have to find the, the alternative ways to put to, to support the things that we really want because our, our environment has changed. So I'm, I would, I'm speaking against the amendment. Any other comments on the amendment itself? Yeah, I would speak against it only because we would have to retain all three with that same number of hours and the titles. And if we're trying to reimagine, then we won't be able to do that reimagining so that we could keep what's valuable to Valley Vista and to the district and continue to get this funding. Cause I think we want all of those things. So. All in favor of the amendment. The amendment? The amendment. Yeah. Aye. All opposed to the amendment? Nay. Nay. Um, the amendment does not carry. Are there any other moves to amend or table or anything with this resolution? Sorry, I would call the question the amendment. I, I would the resolution? To, yeah, the resolution. Okay. Sorry. I would say the resolution, yes. Okay, so that means we are voting on the resolution itself. Yeah, I move to approve 2223 20. Uh, is there a second? I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Me. Nay. Any abstentions? Me. Okay, that's not, we'll have to do a Brown Act training about abstentions, but. Um, the motion carries the resolution passed. And I know it's a hard conversation and really hard moving forward, but I personally have faith in our staff and making sure the community is more involved in the conversations and what our childcare looks like, absolutely. Um, and keeping our amazing staff in the positions that are best for them. Um, and with that, that is all of our action items. And we actually don't have any discussion or information items. So I'm not gonna allow for public comment on things that don't exist. Um, so now we move on to future business. Is there 
I mean, I think I think childcare is a very yeah. I was gonna say I think business. for the next one. Or yeah, the, I think next board meeting, the one after we need to mm -hmm. talk about how we are going to retain these folks that are so valuable to this school and McKinley, probably as well. And yes. how do we partner with them, keep the funding, and create just one equitable um, childcare option that works for all families. Mm -hmm. I just want to say I have complete faith in our staff also. Um, I'm just a, I, I'm, uh, I'm a sucker for tears. So, and, and I, <laughs> um, but uh, I really thank you all for coming. It was really, um, I'm really glad you did. Um, I think it, it really is going to move it to some, something that is going to be really cool and specific to Valley Vista maybe. So is please this a future, keep involved and really come. Is this a future business item? Yes. Okay. But that was also part of my thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, student board members, is there any future business you all would like to see as we near the end of, oh my God, it's not really that close to the end, but it feels, it's we have only a few meetings left, you guys. In the present and the future, I'd like to thank you guys as well. <laughs> <laughs> Any other future I, business? Um, I know Tony at one point, probably like a year ago, talked about a guidance alignment. And um, we've talked in the past about raising the population of our BIPOC students in our APs and honors classes. Um, and so I was just wondering, since we do have students starting to request classes and master scheduling, if we can get some type of preliminary update, you know, run like a query in Aries or something to see if we've increased those numbers and how we're doing on that. Maybe that could even be presented at the equity meeting, sure. but that's something I would love to see. Um, this isn't a new request, but I guess I'll voice it. I've asked uh, Tony and Matthew for an update on what PD we provide to brand new teachers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and making sure our newest staff members are being supported and included and we can retain them for as long as possible. Um, so that'll be it. coming down the pipeline in the next couple months. I uh, want to raise another issue that we had talked about before. We actually raised this before the pandemic and it was scheduled for a transportation update. Mm -hmm. And then we said, forget about that until after the pandemic. <laughs> We're after the pandemic now, and uh, we're I'm, we're hearing a lot at our office hours about the cost of field trips, transportation, and yeah. I know we have 15 buses, but we don't have bus drivers to drive them. And so I think an update for the community about the situation of our transportation uh, is warranted. And, yeah. We've um, been we've been in discussion about that. That's that's coming. Great. Um, I am going to adjourn us back to closed session. Yeah. Well, no closed.